Well, good morning. Good morning. The time is now 9.39 and, and a quorum of the board is present. The State Board of Education meeting of March 12, 2013 is hereby called to order. First item is approval of agenda and order of priority. Is there a motion? I move approval. Moved by order. John, supported by Eileen, two people who were out late last night. Enough to do this. Uh, any changes to the agenda? All in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed, same. Thank you. Looking at the uh, M Live report, looks like you had an interesting panel last night. I might hear about it later. So, one of those places. Uh, Mertz, if you would, you're going to do the typical mm -hmm. introductions. Good morning, and welcome to the State Board of Education meeting. I'd like to introduce you to the people around the table. To my left is Mike Flanagan. He's the state superintendent and the chairman of the State Board of Education. And as we go around the table to the left, it's John Austin. John Austin is the board's president, and he's from Ann Arbor. Next to John is Cassandra Albrich. She will be joining the meeting later by phone. She's the board's vice president, and she's from Rochester Hills. And as we go around the table again, you will see the chair of Dan Varner, <coughs> who's under the weather today. He's the board's secretary. He's from Detroit, but he is joining us on the phone. Hi, Dan. Good morning. And then Lupe Ramos Montini is from Grand Rapids. And then next to her, also from Grand Rapids, the Michigan Teacher of the Year, Bobby Jo Kenyon. She teaches at Ottawa Hills High School. She's a math and science teacher, and she sits at the board table. And across the table is Eileen Weiser from Ann Arbor. Next to her, Kathleen Strauss from Detroit. Michelle Fecto, she's also from Detroit, and she's the board's NASB delegate. NASB is their association, National Association of State Boards of Education. Next to me, Richard Ziley will be joining us very shortly. He's the board's treasurer, and he's from Dearborn. Thank you. Thank you, Marks. I think Richard's on his way, he says. Mm -hmm. He'll be soon. The first item on today's meeting is uh, it's really, it, it's something that particularly for board members that have been on for a while, um, on the board for a while, we thought it would be good to update you. We've had some new people join the department in the last few years. And especially when we had the, um, the orientation for new board members, both Michelle and Lupe, they, we, we debriefed and thought, talked about it at agenda planning that this might be a good thing to just have our major directors uh, uh, be here with us and and speak briefly so we've got a we've got a little program ready for that and I think some of the audience members as a matter of fact who knew we were doing this are here for that reason also um, I do want to start I know this is a little bit it's getting old probably but you'll see I'm leading into something that this first item is just uh, admittedly my I'm trying to focus us on kids every meeting as we start, and I, without any embarrassment, used uh, my grandkids on a regular basis. Uh, so the, here's one again. But I, if I must say so myself, I thought this was a pretty good shot. This was a day when some of us were communicating, and I said, I've got a babysit. <laughs> that's, that's our one-year-old, Avery, and literally that uh, we live just down the road here on Grand River, and that deer came up and uh, wondered who that kid was. <laughs> <laughs> the reason I wanted to show that picture also is I think it's evident to you from our meetings once a month that we really have a pretty strong family here. And the MDE team really, uh, I've come to admire each and every one of them, but we do act and operate as a family. It's hard not to when you work together so, uh, so often and with pretty intense issues on a daily basis. So that's why uh, we're really proud to have them join us today and for you to be able to see their expertise. We can show Mr. Ziley that, that picture again if we can. I don't want to overdo this, but just leave it on in the background. I've seen it before. No, you haven't. Not this one? Look, Richard. Okay, hi, I see. <laughs> okay. which, which one is your grandson? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Take it off, please. <laughs> <laughs> I knew there was a sense of humor there somewhere. It's just taken a while. <laughs> so this is that a variation of that same orientation, and uh, we've included an organizational chart, as you can see. 
um, in your packet. And we've asked everyone to give kind of a brief summary of their role and responsibilities and maybe say a little bit about themselves. The first we're going to start with actually is, is the immediate team that I work with on a daily basis. And by that I mean pretty much directly. So that would be Marty, Allison, Karen, and Mertz. And I don't know who's starting with that. I'm sorry, I think uh, the board knows who I am. I'm Marty Ackley. I'm the I'm the, Marty Ackley, I'm the Director of the Office of Public and Governmental Affairs. Um, I've been with the department almost 10 years, uh, doing um, mostly um, public information. Recently, in the last year, adding governmental affairs to my responsibility. We're supposed to add something that, a little something personal that people don't know about us. And I think what um, people don't know about me is I was the model for the famous painting by Edvard um, Munch called The Scream. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Few people know that fact. And I, I, I'm, I am older than I look. So that's a little something about me. That's funny. Well, that's a hard act to follow. Um, I think you know me too, but I'm Alice Sand Henry. I'm special assistant to Mike, and I've been with the department for not quite two years now, coming previously from the workforce development area, working with the State Workforce Board. Happy to be here and really interested. And I don't have a good fun fact. I'll just say I'm proud mother of three college students at Michigan State. So pro mm. public education uh, graduates and hopefully soon higher ed graduates as well. They're all studying engineering. I am Karen Carefoot, Mike's scheduler. You have all probably worked with me at some point. Um, my fun fact is a year ago this week, I started maternity leave. My child is almost one and has started walking. Are we just going down the line here? Uh, no, I think it's Sven Mertz. Mertz is going to join in here. Hi, I'm Marilyn Schneider, and my nickname is Mertz. You've probably all figured that out, but if you don't know that, you need to know it because nobody uses my real name, and I don't care which name you use. I'm the state board executive, so I do all things board related, and I'm happy to do that. And um, Nice to meet you all. Thanks for coming. And I should say one other thing that this team has picked up the slack on. Um, I don't really have an assistant. Um, we gave that up in one of the budget cut cuts recently. And, you know, in the old days, those were called, quote, secretaries, but they're important positions. So, in effect, that team has picked up this up. When I first came here, I thought, scheduler? What do you do with a scheduler? And it was pre-Karen. Pre Someone else was in that spot. But you'd have to... It didn't take me more than a few days to realize you get dozens of requests a day to either speak or show up at something, or and that's not, of course, counting email and the rest. And, you know, as state superintendent, you do need to be available for, theoretically, for 10 million citizens that want to in some way interact. So uh, I was glad I got talked out of that by some folks as eliminating that position because it's just, uh, you can imagine, if we missed ones that we really need to try to do on behalf of the board and the department and the citizens, it would be a problem. And I think, what did, what did uh, you recently call yourself uh, in terms of the uh, gate? Uh, I have several names for it. I like gatekeeper, and the governor's office has recently kept their schedule door because slammer. Door slammer, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but on a serious note, it takes a, it's an art because people, uh, there's only so many hours in a day. And, it, and you just can't be available to everyone to the degree that you would like to be. So it's a very thoughtful job and appreciate the work that all of them do. And then now we're going to turn to the deputy superintendents. And each of them, I think, is going to lead intros related to their own, uh, their own direct reports, with, which are the directors as part of this team. And I think we're going to start with Carol. So Carol, please. Good. Am I on? Good morning. Um, we looked at this chart and sort of chuckled because we're going to do it left to right, but that doesn't necessarily tell us what, tell you what our positions might be. Um, so I'll start on the, on the left of this chart, and um, I've probably been here the longest. Um, I'm responsible for everything that's um, administrative in nature that, that keeps the department running. We also do a large support function, which is to support our colleagues within the department and to support some things out in the school districts as well. Um, one of the things that Mike talks about all the time, and um, I always smile because being a grandparent is very, very special, 
and we have two grandkids now. One is three and a half, and one is just about six months. And I was cleaning this weekend, and I found this box of treasured baby clothes, and I found our three and a half year old uh, grandson's dad's Michigan State sweater, and it looks like an old man's sweater. It sort of buttons down three buttons here. We skyped over the weekend, and I said, Henrik, Grandma found Daddy's sweater. It's going to fit you. It's your size. He said. I don't like it, Gamma. It's ugly. So all that hard work, I washed it. It's all ready to go. So I don't like it, Gamma. Um, we'll, we can start um, on, the, on the far left, and I'm going to introduce Jane Schultz to you. Um, Jane is one of our newer directors. Jane? Good morning. I'm Jane Schultz. Thank you. I'm Jane Schultz. I'm the director of the Office of Financial Management. Uh, we do the budgeting for the department. We do the accounting, um, which includes the cash management system. We are also in charge of internal audits, and so we do a lot with the um, pupil audits and things like that and other internal audits in the agency. Uh, we have purchasing and um, facilities also under my area. So um, on a personal note, I have three sons also all in Michigan public universities, two at my alma mater, Michigan State, and one at the other school down the road that I don't like to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you, Jane. Kyle Grunt. Which way are we going? I remember Phil, whatever his name was, Good morning, everyone. My name is Kyle Grant. I'm the director of the Office of School Support Services here at the Department of Ed. Um, our area really uh, is kind of a, a broad area, but kind of breaks down into two pieces. We have a school health and safety side that um, encompasses not only bullying and health education, physical education, but all of our child nutrition programs. When you think of school lunch and school breakfast. And then we have a, a chunk that's focused on kind of internal processes in our grants office. So we come to the board often with grant criteria and, and grant awards. And so kind of how we work that process internally as well as all of our online systems that schools apply for their dollars through, uh, like the Michigan Electronic Grant System. And we also have a little teeny tiny area that everything else gets dumped into. So you think of people transportation, um, a bunch of other kind of uh, support functions that don't necessarily fit in other places, We fits in our family. So a little uh, fact about me, you might notice this already given my size, but I'm Mike's, one of Mike's bodyguards. <laughs> um, I actually, you can, can't tell, I've lost a little weight, but I can fit a bulletproof vest underneath here, so you can't tell, and my earpiece is hanging out the back here. So. <laughs> Thank you, Kyle. Next is Joetta Parker. Good morning. I'm the HR do Director for the Department of Education. I work for the Department of Civil Service, but I partner with the Department of Education and I sit here. I help them with uh, personnel matters such as hiring and workplace relations. Um, I can't follow Kyle's act. I'm not Mike's bodyguard or anybody else's, but I have worked for the state for 18 years and I'm coming up on three years with the Department of Education. Thank you. Dan Hanrahan. Good morning. I'm Dan Hanrahan, the director of the Office of State Aid and School Finance here at the department. As the name would imply, we have two pretty major functions. One is uh, accounting for the state school aid fund, the $11 billion of state school aid that flows through the department here. Uh, we have to um, account for that money from the beginning, you know, the uh, original appropriations. We work with uh, the state budget office to develop those right on through the preparation of the financial reports for the school aid fund. We calculate and distribute those payments uh, on a monthly basis here at the department, pulling in data from CEPI and from other offices here at the department for the categorical funding and from county treasurers and so forth. We work with the treasury department to, you know, to accomplish that. Um, a lot of school districts pledge their state school aid, they borrow and for cash flow purposes and pledge that. So we work with banks to, a lot of them have to get a lower interest rate. They can uh, have set-asides that will intercept those payments and pay them directly to the, to the bondholders. And on the school finance side of our department, uh, our office, that's where we offer technical assistance to school districts who have to account for all their revenues, not just the state school aid, but federal monies and local monies as well. Um, we have a prescribed chart of accounts that comes from the federal government. 
they're all required to keep their financials according to those prescribed accounts. And then we collect that data and forward it on to the federal government, the Center for Educational Statistics, um, so that we can get our fair share of federal funds and so forth. And we have a public school accounting manual that they follow in order to do that. We administer that manual. Uh, some of the miscellaneous things that we do as well, we work with monitoring deficit districts, districts that ended the year in a fund balance, a negative fund balance, um, so we work with them. Uh, we negotiate indirect cost rates with the federal government so school districts can charge that to uh, their federal grants and so forth. And then pupil accounting is under our office as well. Uh, the state is required to have a administer a pupil accounting manual by statute, so we'll do that as well. On a public note, I um, mean a personal note, you can probably tell that unlike my peers here at the department, many of whom are former principals and superintendents and teachers and so forth, they're naturals of public speaking. I got into accounting in hopes that I would never have to speak, you know, in, in, in front of people like even like this. Um, and then as a result of that, I think I have a reputation for being almost quiet to a fault. And I, uh, I blame that on the fact that I come from a large Irish Catholic family. There were seven kids. I was the youngest of the seven. I have six older sisters, so <laughs> <laughs> it was hard for me to get a word in edgewise until <laughs> I was about 11 years old. So. Thank you very much, Dan. Nancy Robertson. Good morning. I'm Nancy Robertson, the state librarian and the director of the Library of Michigan, which is in the Michigan Library and Historical Center across Allegan Street from this building. Um, I, on a personal note, I enjoy birding and collecting early 20th century decorated cloth bindings. Uh, the library itself focuses on providing reference research for state government and all of its employees, preserving and making accessible the published record of the state and its peoples, uh, providing services to libraries of all types, including school libraries, um, throughout the state uh, with benchmarking and uh, uh, continuing education and so forth. And uh, we also are the administrators with our federal money and with the money that recently was put into the uh, state budget by Governor Snyder and then the legislature for the Michigan e-library, which is Michigan's virtual library with millions of online resources available to every resident of the state of Michigan at no cost to them. Cost to us, no cost to them. Thank you. Mel.org, right? Right, exactly. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> Thank you very much, Nancy. Uh, Bob Taylor. By the way, Nancy, just for Bob, was, as you know, that this got moved back to the department uh, two In years two ago. Fall of 2009. So we're just happy it's a great alignment. It makes a lot of sense, especially with respect to our education mission. So welcome aboard again. Sorry, Bob. Okay. I'm Bob Taylor, and I've been here since 1985. And my goal is process education. The state laws require MBE. Great. Thank you all very much. I'm really, really proud of the team that works with us. Um, they're a great group of people. They have a phenomenal staff that works with them, um, really committed, very dedicated, um, and I love every day that I'm here working with them, and I mean that truly. Um, I'd like to turn it over to Susan. Since I'm in the middle, so I'm not left or right, which probably <laughs> says a lot about me. Anyway. Um, I'm Susan Brom, a Deputy Superintendent of the newest department within the Michigan Department of Education. Um, I've been here for 
one year, one month, and 15 days. Um, so I would say, then. yeah, I'm an, I'm an infant as well as the entire office is an infant. Um, before I introduce our stellar leaders in the office of Great Start, um, I'll tell you a little personal story. If you've ever wondered what happened to me along the way, um, I don't know if all of you remember VJ Day. <laughs> and if you do, that kind of dates you date you or, or whatever, and it's not necessarily politically correct, I don't think, anymore. But anyway, I was the queen of VJ Day in 1970, so if you wonder where I veered off, <laughs> that would be it. Okay, Lindy? I'm, I'm Lindy Bush. I'm the Director of Early Childhood Education and Family Services, which has been at the Department of Education. I've been with the department for eight, a little better than 18 years. Um, before I was with the department, I worked with young children and aspiring teachers of young children. And I still like little kids. When I started, my own kids were in high school, and I told them they should probably finish school before they had kids. I did not mean that you had to go to graduate school for a decade. But now they're done, I think, both of them. And Maybe there's some hope for me to be a grandparent like everybody else gets to be. Because <laughs> I do like little kids. Early Childhood Education and Family Services has a variety of functions within the department. We manage grant programs, we write standards, we develop accountability for programs for children birth through age 8 and after school for K-12. Our, probably our best known program is the Great Start Readiness Program. It's been in the news lately because the governor has proposed a big increase and we certainly do support that expansion. Um, we know that the program works, that it's good for kids and it really does help those, uh, especially those with sort of mild to moderate risks or um, uh, you know, who, who just need a little boost. But we know that for many children who are at risk, that one year is kind of too little, too late. So we have a number of other programs within our office and in the other offices and across state government that help young children who are vulnerable and need support. And that's kind of our goal, um, to help kids do better so that they'll enter kindergarten safe, thriving, developmentally on track, and do well. So. Um, we really enjoy, we don't just like little children, we want to do the right thing for them and help them do better in their lives. Next, Jeremy, who is at this point doing two jobs at one time and getting pay of one. <laughs> Lisa. Good morning. My name is Lisa Brewer Wellraven. I'm the director of the Child Development and Care Program in the Office of Great Start. I've been at MDE for about a year and a half uh, when our office was moved from the Department of Human Services over to the Department of Education to be a part of the Office of Great Start. I have a seven-year-old and I feel a little bit of pressure today because we're going to our first mother-son dance. <laughs> and uh, we're going with a big group of friends, so I hope we have a good time. 
the Child Development and Care Program really has two main focuses. One of those is to provide assistance for low-income children birth to 12 to ensure that they have access to high-quality child care and early learning programs. Last year, we provided that assistance to a little bit over 50,000 children. And the second focus of the funding for our program is to improve the quality of all early learning settings. And we have a major initiative called Great Start to Quality, which is going to help us identify the level of quality of all of those settings across Michigan. Good morning, Sally Vaughn, Deputy Superintendent, Chief Academic Officer. And uh, where Carol has the administrative functions of the department, the academic functions come under my purview. And so as you can see, it goes all the way from school improvement to accountability and assessment to the school reform office, special ed, uh, teacher prep. So each of the directors will introduce themselves and uh, give them a little, a little information about their offices. So Deb, we're going to start with you. I'm Deborah Clemens, and I am the uh, executive director for the school reform office, a alias school reform officer. Um, I work with the lowest achieving schools. Those are the ones that are in the bottom 5%. And we also are doing a little work on trying to close the achievement gap as that relates to uh, African-American males, because a large percentage of the students in priority schools, which, we're, which used to be called PLA schools or persistently lowest achieving schools, the primary uh, target uh, student body population is primarily African-American students, so we're trying to address that issue as well. Uh, I remind my, I, I do this work in collaboration with many offices, and I have to frequently remind my colleagues that these are our schools and our district. They're not mine. <laughs> <laughs> On a personal note, um, I used to be a tall, ravishing, Blonde when I came to the department in 2006. <laughs> so look at me. <laughs> Thanks, Deb. Uh, Joseph, let's see if you can beat that one. <laughs> Ravishing. Ravishing. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'm Joseph Martineau. I'm the Executive Director of the Bureau of Assessment and Accountability, and I've been with the department for eight and a half years. Um, I do have five children attending public schools in Michigan, and uh, we'll have five children attending universities sometime soon, probably all at the same time, because two, the two oldest decided they want a PhD. I'm very frightened. <laughs> um, I was the other day driving down the road with, my, with uh, my, one of my children, and I said, you know, you're a really good kid. He said, you're a good dad, believe it or not. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so at any rate, <laughs> at any rate, that's uh, that's what I go home to. It, it's, it's wonderful. Um, the uh, the Bureau of Assessment and Accountability. We have uh, four offices. Uh, we have the Office of um, Evaluation, Strategic Research, and Accountability that is headed by Vanessa Kiesler. Uh, responsible for our accountability, any work that we do, around edu do surrounding educator evaluations, uh, strategic research. We also have the Office of System Psychometrics and Measurement Research headed by Dave Judd. They're responsible for making sure that we have high quality systems, high quality data, uh, valid and reliable assessments. We also have the Office of Standards and Assessment that is responsible for the operations of all of our testing programs as well as business operations which handles logistics and uh, our contracts and finance. And that is headed by Marilyn Roberts. And the Office of Standards and Assessment is headed by Vince Dean. Sorry, I forgot to say that. Thanks, Joseph. Uh, Linda. Good morning. My, um, I'm Linda Ford, and I'm the Director of the Office of Education Improvement and Innovation. And that houses uh, four major programs, Educational Technology, where we're trying to get the infrastructure put in place across the state in order to have students learn in different ways and also to be able to accommodate the assessments that Joseph's putting in place um, that will be online. Uh, public School Academies, Curriculum and Instruction, 
and um, then also the school improvement support, which goes all the way from school improvement to uh, the SIG grants, the $2 million grants that go to the, uh, the buildings, some of the buildings that Deb works with on a regular basis. I've been here long enough to uh, remember when Deb was blonde, and um, <laughs> so, um, and, and ravishing and all of the other good things. Um, I fostered a girl, uh, she came to my home when she was 14, and she's been there ever since. Um, she's now adult. Um, she went through all of the things that you can imagine a, a child comes into foster care for. But one of the things that became one of my great learnings, because I've been doing that school improvement thing for years when she came to live with me, was that she had been in 21 buildings 18 times before she graduated from school. And if you know anything about the research, that means she never went to school because you lose six months for every year, every time you move. So to her great credit, though, um, while she did all the stereotypical things that you could imagine, she, also, she brought home a child um, when she was just shy of her 18th birthday. She has made sure that he got a good education, and he's on the honor roll in a local school. So um, he's doing quite well. So that's to her credit and her hard work. Um, so that's, that's kind of what we're doing at the, in our office and some personal things. Good. Thanks, Linda. Mike Radke. Yes, good morning. My name is Mike Radke. I'm the director of the Office of Field Services. And in our office, we have, a, uh, we basically um, allocate grant money to uh, the schools. Um, and it's about a billion dollars in, in state and federal grant money. We have a Title I program, which is uh, primarily to serve those kids most at risk of failing. Our, our Title II program, which is teacher and principal effectiveness. Our Title III program, which is our English language learner uh, program. And then we have a series of relatively small grants for very special populations of kids. So a small grant for immigrants to the state. Uh, our migrant program, it's a small program uh, and a declining population at this point in time. A homeless program, which unfortunately is growing by leaps and bounds at this time, but a very needy population of, of kids. And then a program for neglected children and delinquent children. So the neglected children, generally you can think of them as kids who are in foster care. And the delinquent kids, you can think of them as kids who have... Um, had some difficulty and are incarcerated in one of the institutions locally or at the state level here in Michigan. So uh, we also do a tremendous amount of work. All of these grants depend on excellent school improvement plans. So we collaborate extensively with um, many other offices, but certainly Linda's office and the, and the Office of Assessment and Accountability. Um, Lindy's office and uh, basically every other office here because many of these programs kind of wrap around and try to make whole some of the initiatives in these other offices. Um, our goal really is to accelerate student achievement and close gaps and we have a, a very committed uh, group of people doing that. On a personal note, I have two children and the last time I did this I talked about my son and my grandson who he has uh, uh, blessed me with. Uh, to be, uh, for equity purposes, I have to talk about my daughter, <laughs> who I just visited this weekend in uh, Chicago. She just won a national award for um, an exhibit she did at the Jane Hall, uh, Jane Addams uh, Hall Museum in Chicago, um, basically talking about the major contributions that domestic workers have made in the state. So I'm very proud of her as well. Mike. Flora. Good morning. I'm Flora Jenkins and I'm the director of the Office of Professional Preparation Services. And we have two units. One unit deals with um, the approval of all of our teacher preparation institutions and all of their programs and developing the standards by which those um, programs are approved. And then on the other side, um, we have those individuals who work with issuing certificates approving permits and approvals through the school districts and all of those kinds of things, and as well as um, teacher certification, revocation, and suspensions. So we work with Bob Taylor to do that. Um, on a personal note, 
I have a son who is a sophomore at Michigan State University, and he just got notified a couple weeks ago that he got one of their cultural affairs positions, so I don't have to pay room and board next year. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> and also, many years ago, I was a contestant on The Price is Right, so, you know. <laughs> what did you win? Did you win? Um, I won a lot of stuff, <laughs> good stuff. I won like a beautiful dining room table, which I have in my home, and lots of lolly crystal and, you know, tableware, stuff like that. But I didn't get the big prize. I went over on the spin, so. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Flora. Eleanor? What a good segue. You went over on the spending, so that would be me. Um, I'm, my name is Eleanor White. I'm the Director of Office of Special Education. And it is my job to champion the fact that education is for all children. Autism is the fastest growing uh, eligibility category in special education. However, most students who are in special education are identified with eligibility of learning disabled or speech and language impaired and should be educated in general education. So it's kind of nice that I was last to speak because my, my job is to touch every office and to remember to include students with disabilities. I have a unique position because we are the only state in the nation that has education for students birth to 26. I knew that when I took the job, I took it anyway. So um, it, it's, um, it's certainly interesting. We're only one of five states that's a birth mandate. We work with IDEA funds that flow from OSEP to our... I knew I had an electric personality, but... Uh, <laughs> it's probably my nails. Um, I just want to take this opportunity. I, I think I've told everyone everything interesting that I can possibly think of about me. Um, I will tell you that I like to be low profile. I really like colorful clothes, and I want to thank Michael Flanagan because I'm sure he's responsible for my email address, Whitey One. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Honor. And last but not least, Patty Cantu. Sorry, Eleanor, I'm last. We CTE people don't let people forget about us. I don't know if you've noticed that. I'm Patty Cantu, and I'm the director of the Office of Career and Technical Education. I've been in my current role for 12 years and in state government for 20. Um, we provide state and federal funding to career-specific instructional programs at the high school level. And we make sure that those programs are aligned with our corresponding community college programs and make sure that we work with employers so that our programs have our teaching state-of-the-art stuff that's out there. We also help to coordinate the department's expansion of early middle colleges, which are five-year high schools where a student earns a diploma and some <coughs> substantial post-secondary credit at the same time. Um, I am not a green and white or a maize and blue. I'm kind of like the Switzerland mm -hmm. um, because I'm a golden black. I'm a Golden Grizzly, an alumni of Oakland University, <laughs> but I lean a little bit to the green side because a fun fact about Oakland is it started off as a satellite campus of MSU, so thank you. Thanks, Patty. Mike? A couple of just closing remarks. Um, first of all, I, I have, you can see something, I can't say something about each of these individuals individually, but I can assure the board and, and anyone watching in our audience, every one of them is expert in their area. Every one of them brings uh, intelligence to their job. Um, and the most important thing is we have people, as I've gotten to know them, that really care about the kids in this state and the citizens of this state, and they work every day hard towards that. I, um, you know, like deputies, these are fantastic people, each of them, and they have a lot of responsibility on a day-to-day -day basis. You can probably see from just the, the breadth of the work that even though I, I was a local superintendent 20, well, 22 years ago, uh, and by the way, like a little bit of mixing in my personal, I talk about the grandkids, but my kids, I have a picture in my office of my kids who Krista was preschool at that time, and she's a public school teacher right now, and they're standing on the board table uh, in Farmington, Farmington Hills, where I was superintendent, um, and it reminds me every day that even though I have grandkids, I actually went through a time as superintendent when my kids were preschool and elementary. And kind of say something that I regret a little bit is I didn't probably have as much balance as I, I would have, uh, should have had at that time. 
and we, we work towards that. There's a way to do our work here, but also have balance, and you could hear, I think, a lot of that ring, ring through with uh, the stories that people have about their own, their own lives here. Um, but one thing, you know, I, I know I've said this a number of times, but it, it is a challenge here. Uh, we had a few thousand employees at one time. Uh, when I was a local superintendent, there were a few thousand employees at the Department of Ed. Now there's a few hundred. Um, most of those are funded by federal money, so they're not allowed to do state work. Um, that's a particular challenge for us. Um, I would say in my own case, I could spend 80 hours a week doing nothing but work that's involved in this particular building and spend most of the time that I do spend each week on those kind of issues. So I've developed a little bit of thick skin because I think there's occasionally criticism in the field you know, it just goes with the territory that, you know, why don't we do this, why don't we do that? I think this is maybe an opportunity to show the breadth of work we have to do just to make and help the system function. The system with two million kids in it, the system with 4,000 schools. And uh, we spend all day on Friday, we've organized it this way in something called Soups Group. And in that soups group, it's not only the people you met, but they bring <coughs> with them, depending on the topic, and these are normally in half hour, 45 minute increments, where we make pretty quick decisions together. Sometimes it's my call alone if, if, if we can't work it out together, but often we come in and, and uh, with that full team. And the, the reason I want to emphasize this is this is a team that goes, at least organizationally, from the superintendent to consultants so it's not just directors and others who are working on specific projects and and help us make better decisions because we we get a fairly diverse view speaking of diversity I think uh, you know we have typical images of diversity certainly along the the, uh, the, the lines of uh, uh, race and ethnicity typically we talk about but if you notice here it's it's not just a diverse group that makes better decisions um, because of that kind of diversity there's gender diversity there's age diversity I mean, I've become more aware of the fact that when we've been recruiting, and Joetta and others have worked hard at this, that we need to try to continually balance the team as we have openings to try to make sure we get a breadth of view. Age, to me, is a relatively new one on my radar screen um, because I can see it in my own kids who are now young adults, as you know, with, with grandkids that I show off every month. But I, I look at them and realize they're in a whole different world. They, they see things in a way that we have young consultants that will come into our meetings and change the tide on decisions we make often because they're like my own kids that, that you know, we have a family clan Facebook. I dare not get on a regular Facebook. I'm afraid where it would go. But this, this one that's just my kids and my wife, you know, we, in learning to work on that, it's very, um, it's helped me understand that whole world that they're in. It's why I think we're more open and pretty much invented seat time waivers, for example, because you start to realize that, that young people are in a different place than most of us were when we, when we were educated. So uh, I say that, that it, a real value in this team is to have, um, uh, I won't use Susan's term, but seasoned folks like myself. Your term, actually, why don't we just get it on the table for a couple of us is... Fossils. Fossils, right? <laughs> and, then, and then some young folks so that you have this diversity. And I don't want to uh, have us uh, sound as martyrs on this about the couple of thousand to the couple of hundred because um, we can do this. I don't know what you would do with a couple of thousand, honestly. Um, could we use uh, <laughs> a few more state employees? Uh, the answer is always yes, you know, and, I, and I, we find a balance. Um, I'll just have to say this. I mean, one of the things we have to be cognizant of is respect with the legislature and the governor, um, maybe even more so with the appropriate committees because we want to make sure that they'll, they'll fund the department appropriately so we can get our work done because they can single-handedly, um, you know, not do that uh, pretty much. So that's the balance we find in this work. And... Um, Let's see, I guess my own personal thing that, that, that I think newer board members wouldn't know, but what I used to say before I had grandkids is, talk, since there's been the kind of university theme, is I live just down the street here on the Grand River, and we used to put out three flags because at one point in time, all three of my kids were, one was at University of Michigan, one was at Michigan State, and one was at Notre Dame. 
and we'd put three flags out, and people would go by in boats and yell at us, pick one, pick one. <laughs> I mean, the anger, genuine anger about who, who do you think you are with, well, that was my world. Uh, <laughs> But I think you can see we're really lucky uh, to a person here to have a, a team that's uh, just top notch, just top notch. So I'm glad to appreciate John and the board for an agenda planning for uh, providing this opportunity, which we've wanted to do for a while. And then we're available for any comments or questions you might have. I'd like to say on behalf of the board, I mean, thank you all for making some time to be with us today and thank you for your hard work um, every day uh, on behalf of our schools. Some of you we see more than others, uh, and it's nice to see everybody and get to know all of you a little bit better, but also to appreciate more um, who you are and, and what you do, and, and again, echo our, um, our real appreciation knowing that it's, uh, it's monumental to work and you all are doing it with, uh, with vigor and courage and um, a good heart and I'm sure frustrations uh, many times. Uh, I think there used to be more diversity in the hair color here, apparently, uh, that we might we need to bring back. But um, And we can learn a lot from fossils, right? It's in our science uh, standards, probably. But thank you all very much for sharing that today, and much appreciated. Great. Thanks. Thanks for the opportunity, and thanks, guys. You're all welcome to stay, but I can see you're rushing for the doors. <laughs> and Eleanor, you picked that email. Don't put that on me. I'm not. <laughs> Our next item is we're kind of shifting places here. I think Sally and Flora and Raj are going to join us at the table. We'll give them a second to set up and, and board to... to a bit. You. Dan, you're doing okay? Great, thank you. Okay, don't don't push yourself. Hopefully you can So this item is the presentation on the revised Michigan standards for the preparation of central office administrators and let me spend just a moment giving some context for this. Um, you know, as context for both of the items, this one and the next one, the requirement for administrator certification was eliminated in 1993. Um, I remember that specifically because I was certified and became a superintendent in 89, and then within a couple of years that was done away with. Um, it was reinstated in 2005 as voluntary certification, and then in 2009, PA 2000. 205 changed the voluntary certification to required certification for anyone hired as an administrator after January of 2010. This includes, just for your understanding, it's central office and probably not everyone in central office, but it's superintendents, principals, assistant principals, or any other administrator whose primary responsibility is for instructional programs. And all administrators are required to complete continuing ed credits every five years to renew their certificates or to remain in their position as an administrator. Um, the first set of standards specify what our future central office administrators need to know and be able to do. And our team here, it's a great team that's been working on this to try to, uh, well, let me turn that over to Sally to not step on her uh, part of this. Uh, so as Mike said, the, we've got two sets of standards to review with you this morning. Uh, the first one we will go over will be the Central Office Administrator Standards, and with me are Flora Jenkins and Raja Smart, and they will lead you through the presentation. Flora? Okay, I'm going to very quickly turn it over to Raja because <laughs> I, I'm not in a real, you know, my voice is kind of messed up this morning, and Raja has done all the work on getting the standards developed into the place where we can bring them to you. So, Raja? Well, thank you, Flora. Uh, again, my name is Raja Smart. Good morning to all of you. I'm glad to be here. Uh, real, real quickly, um, I was charged with getting this done with, uh, by the Educator Effectiveness Group as well as uh, Dr. Jenkins here. And uh, this is something that we've been trying to work on for some time. As soon as we introduced the 2006 ISLIC standards, they were updated the following year. So we were behind the ball on those as well. So we really need to get those going. And with these particular standards, we think we, we actually know we got it right this time. So the purpose of the central office standards is to outline the principles and foundations of central office administrators. 
uh, oftentimes we need to make the distinction between a, a building level principal and a central office administrator. Uh, second piece is to guide central office administrator preparation programs. Um, with the, as uh, superintendent indicated, once we eliminated the actual certification, so too went the preparation programs. They kind of operated on their own volition. So with these standards, we're incorporating more rigor. And that's what we attempted to do with the 2006 ISLIC standards. So news to know, current program requirements are performance and outcome-based programs as well as interrelator reliability of performance rubrics and assessments. Uh, when I actually started, I think, what, about two or, you know, I've been here quite some time. I can't remember the Almost time. Three years. three years. Okay, I've been here three years. Uh, when I started, our, our administrative programs were not necessarily performance-based. They were just, again, operating under their own volition. Uh, what we decided to do was to, to turn it into a more performance-based um, program preparation. Um, if you were here for the My Intask standards, it's the same type of uh, performance-based outcome that we're looking at. So we're, we're working to be more consistent in our office with the standards. So these standards are in line with the My Intask standards. Is that correct? Uh, so yeah. My Intask, is that what we're calling it? Okay. Um, again, we're incorporating rubrics, performance measures, so they can actually show performance. And this is where we talk about uh, show us what you're actually doing. We have some universities that are doing some phenomenal things. They just have a hard time showing that, as well as any of the alternate route programs for school administrators that we have running. We want them to be able to show us and tell us beyond a shadow of a doubt to have some data to say this is what we're actually doing. And last but not least, cohort dispossession measures to be able to show that these types of individuals can perform the role of a central office administrator. So in 2012, the Michigan Department of Education Work Group was formed to examine policies and practices impacting educator preparation, including administrative preparation. Now, as the sole person that is responsible for this, I kind of operate on a, on a, on a kind of independent level. So uh, I'll, I'll refer to we a lot, but I'm just talking about my multiple personalities, okay? <laughs> that helps me actually get through uh, my workload here, okay? It's like Bruce Wayne in the Dark Knight, okay? That's, that's how I operate. <laughs> so we want to create a connected system for preparation and continuous professional learning. So we're trying to be consistent with the MDE priorities. Um, we're also trying to be consistent as an office in preparation, and that's important for school administration. Again, I'll say this again and again. Program preparation for school administrators has operated out of its own volition. I mean, the teacher programs have been the sole concentration in our state. So we're trying to bring the school administrator component in there as well to make those consistent with one another. Because honestly, some of the things I learned as a teacher, I took with me into school administration and vice versa when I went back to teaching because the administration just was not for me at that point. But it was a good job, don't get me wrong. The MDE work group also examined the um, ISLIC standards for consistency and alignment. Now, there are new ISLIC standards. However, they do not align as well as the current standards that we are proposing adoption of to, uh, again, my NTAS, the future teacher leader standards, stakeholder feedback. We looked at that. I went out to the um, MAPEA meetings, and if any of you have gone to those meetings, you know that can be a pretty tough group. Um, what does that stand for? Uh, excuse me, I'm sorry. The Michigan Association of Professors of Educational Administration, and that is a mouthful, but that is what it stands for. Um, I went to that group, and these are all professors, deans of ed leadership programs, and we had a long conversation about the current standards that we have in place and the proposed standards. And by far, many of them were already moving in the direction of the ELCC standards for accreditation. Now, there is a requirement for teacher programs to seek accreditation, but that is not a requirement for school administrator programs. So with ELCC, the current ELCC standards and implementation in this state, we can require that as well for school administrators. Also, the state superintendents, state board of education and governor priorities, we also looked at those, best practices within central office administration preparation and professional learning. One thing to point out about the ELCC standards is the fact that they are... 
Now, see, I knew you were going to ask me that. <laughs> the ELCC stands, I always forget this, this one, so you'll have to bear with me, okay? The Educational Leadership Consortium, Constituent. Constituent Consortium, Council, yes, it's a mouthful. <laughs> Thank you, Flora. Thank you. Um, again, these standards incorporated the best practices, performance measures. Um, now, we did do a little tweaking to those. They are national standards, but we did want to include uh, the MDE priorities as well. So just further uh, on the changes that we actually made. Those changes reflect the technology initiative. Uh, back in 2006, the ISLIC standard took one whole standard to talk about technology. It seemed to be a lot easier, especially when you're reviewing these programs, to see how they're incorporating technology in all of the coursework not just one uh, standard. We wanted to see that throughout the entire set of standards. Career and college readiness outcomes. These are another uh, important piece. Focus on individual learners. Um, these are actually endorsed by national stakeholders. And one side piece of that, um, the achievement gap. Uh, we really wanted standards that could address the achievement gap as well. As a person who has a personal stake in the achievement gap, as I uh, was born and raised in Flint and was not privileged to attend a school that had the best teachers, I felt it was important to include that component or have standards that can really address that component. Um, I didn't necessarily beat the achievement gap, but I did overcome some obstacles to get me where I am today, and I think our standards should reflect that as well. So the standards, just a, a general overview of the central office standards. They're comprised of seven standards grouped into six categories. Number one being the school district vision, two, the school district culture, and the school district management of organization, operation, and resources. School district collaboration with faculty, community members, and family, and this kind of falls into that community school uh, component that I was raised in. Uh, Flint Community Schools was a community school in every sense of the word community. My mother took advantage of all of those things. So that was a very important component for me personally. Not that these standards are uh, designed specifically by, of my own personal needs, but just of some things that I experienced as well. Five, school district ethics, ethics, integrity, fairness, and practice. Six, school district success of every student by understanding, responding to, and advocating for student learning. As you can see in these standards, many of the MDE priorities that we talk about are in these statements. So for example, number three, the third standard, evaluation and leadership. It says a district level education leader applies knowledge that promotes the success of every student by ensuring the management of the district's organization, operation, and resources through monitoring and evaluation of district management and operational systems. Efficiency, excuse me, efficiently using human fiscal and techno technological with, what is that? I'm sorry, uh, technology within the district, promoting district level policies that protect the welfare and safety of students and staff across the district, developing district capacity for distributed leadership, which is that teacher leadership component, and ensuring that teacher and organizational time is focused on high quality instruction and student learning. And just an example is the way that the standards are set up. You see content, knowledge, and performance. We're actually providing the universities of uh, the alternate route programs, or as we say, non-traditional programs, with a map of how to show performance and what the standards are actually looking for. There's actually also an appendix that I'm designing to accompany the standards. So if they have any questions about how to incorporate this in early childhood, since uh, directors of early childhood, directors of uh, career and tech ed, special ed, uh, supervisors and directors also are required to hold the school administrator certificate, they'll have some guidance of, of a book that they can go to and pull out things that they can use to incorporate in their programs to make that connection in leadership. So as you can see, content knowledge provides evidence of. So when I'm reviewing a school administrator program, there are certain things that the candidate has to have knowledge of. Now keep in mind, these are preparation standards. We cannot incorporate everything that a school needs. Our schools are so different across the board. They are vast experiences. I've taught in suburban and inner city schools, and I can tell you there are some major differences between those two. Um, 
on the flip side of that, we have the performance. So we have the content knowledge, and then the performance po points out the specific performance that they have to have. Now, I can speak, um, you know, specifically about why these standards are uh, very important. Again, they are very closely related to our in-task teacher standards. And that's something we've been looking forward to, some consistency within our office, especially in reviewing programs. And that's so important, especially when you have, um, we want to collaborate more, especially in our own office. So collaboration is key, and we have been collaborating. I'm sure you listened to um, Tom and Sarah discuss the, um, the NTAF standards, and they've said some of the same things that I've said as well. That just shows that collaboration that we have in our office. We're trying to have these standards as consistent as possible so that preparation programs can have a clear understanding. And the, the past standards that we had, the major gripe was the fact that they were very unclear and they were lengthy and they were not specific enough as well as being uh, repetitive. So we wanted to have some, anyone who knows me knows I get straight to the point. So with standards that get straight to the point to say, hey, here you go, this is what you need, this is what has to be done, um, is a plus. So um, the central office preparation programs, creation, approval, and implementation of certification programs, we're looking at these standards as the guiding principles of preparation of central office administrators. Also, the ongoing professional learning provide a basis for ongoing professional learning for school administrators. It's not something that we talk a lot about, but it's something that I'm trying to jump the gun on to uh, include that component in these standards as well. Okay. And I say thank you. Okay. I'll pass it over to Sally. Thanks, Raja. And we will be taking these out for public comment and then returning to the board uh, with a request for approval at the May meeting. So, Mike? So comments, questions by board members. Eileen, please. <coughs> thank you. It's really good. And Raja, I, I, I love your name. <laughs> you know, I love my name, too. No, but I mean, Raja, it's, 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 uh, I, I, I thought, you know, this is the name that propels somebody, or in my case, beyond Saginaw, in your case, beyond Flint. So yeah. thank you. I had, to live, I had to live up to that name, too. Yes. Yeah. It took me uh, a while, but. I, I don't know. You're pretty young from, from my, my fossilized geezer perspective. <laughs> <laughs> um, don't but, go there. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> don't go there. So I have. Um, a comment to make about how valuable this really is. It occurred to me as I was reading it that while we're looking at preparation, that a grid of these values um, would probably help schools evaluate their personnel. And I don't know if you can pull it off because I see, you know, expect, expect this and anticipate that, but uh, to just simply put the values in a grid at the very beginning. Um, and I, I also don't know how you publicize the standards when they're uh, reformulated, whether they go out to schools. But I think this would be an important thing to send. John and I were in, 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 uh, in Ann Arbor last night, <coughs> excuse me, at, at one of the um, fora. And uh, one of the things that struck me after the meeting, and I asked several of the superintendents who immediately handed me business cards, why is it that everybody in anticipates that the public, public Education Finance Act changes would only apply to new schools that would come into being to destroy them, as opposed to how can schools, existing schools, take on the challenges of the kids that we see coming up with deer staring at them in the window uh, so that nobody else would ever want to start a school because there would be no need. And I think that these standards start to go to that. Uh, they, actually, they do. If we, if we can prepare people this way, then they'll be nimble. I, I also last week met with one of our auto companies on STEM issues. And uh, the person I met with said that going through bankruptcy was the most gut-wrenching experience that he and his colleagues had ever experienced, that it was uh, awful. It was like losing a family member. It continued on and on and on, and everything they valued disappeared. And he said, but in the end, we recognized that we weren't servicing our customers that we had no focus toward that, and that's what they have now. So this is that, that student-centered customer focus, and I really think it would be extremely valuable for the field. I think it would just clarify things and make things pop out, so thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Eileen. Those are good suggestions I think we can mm -hmm. follow up on. Sally's nodding. John, please. Um, thank you, Raja. Can I ask a question? The context in which these standards are delivered, uh, are these teachers or administrators who 
go back to a teacher or a training institution and get a certificate or credential in central office administration or is it an ongoing continuing education that builds this stuff in what's the what's the context or a typical way people would receive these standards and what do they do they get certified in some way I guess yes uh, they're all of the above actually um, they're central they can be certified and well actually they can receive a school administrator certificate with the central office designation on that certificate we currently have two designations on the certificate which is a k-12 school administrator school principal and a central office administrator so they can be used in the context of uh, training administrators, uh, ongoing professional learning, uh, to earn your certificate. They're also for our non-traditional programs that want to certify central office administrators. So um, all of the above. And would you speak a little, I know we've done it at Soup's Group, but a little bit, uh, any of you, about what some of those alternatives are like, associations and others that might... Uh... Well, yeah. well, currently, well, that's for, that's for uh, school building. But currently, we don't uh, have any central office programs. I am working with one group to try to get them off the ground. It is a difficult task. Uh, however, I am working with them to um, possibly have a central office uh, school administrator alternate route program. Um, and it's, it, it's comprised of training, but they, have, they are bound by the standards. This is not a touch and go program. You are bound by the standards. Um, you are also, in that particular program, they're actually bound by a uh, a test as well, an assessment. So the standards help drive those those uh, alternate route programs as well. So it's not a touch and go. Uh, you have to meet those standards. You have to show that the individuals in those programs are learning what is required to be a central office administrator. And on top of that, they have to do, they have to complete an internship of like 600 hours. So that's a lot. That's double what we require uh, for our traditional program, but that's something they actually volunteer to do. So I appreciate that, that they, they feel like they have to do that kind of work to show that they are um, training and preparing central office administrators. Flora, would you, uh, or Sally, or Rod, but I think to the context of John's question, it's probably going to bloom in both areas. I mean, certainly the traditional areas that do a good job now and will continue to and um, but that was based on some le some law changes, correct? That opened up the door to alternative. Right. There was a, a change in the law that allowed that that authorized alternate routes, and so we can have those associations come in and and do alternate route programs. And the associations are also authorized to issue or do endorsement programs. So we had to 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 make sure that we had standards around each of those things so that we could look at those programs, review them, and make sure that they were meeting the standards. Uh, one of the key issues about these standards is that performance-based element, so that you do have that demonstration that a person who, who's going into central office, they can show you that they know about budgeting. They know about working with the community, so there's some project or some demonstration that they really can do these things, other than just sitting in a classroom and, and getting a degree in the school leadership, and you've done the coursework, but you haven't really had the experience right. or had that experiential component to them. Yeah, I mean, I could speak to that. I, I struggled for at least two years as a new superintendent, and I think uh, it's because we didn't have this kind of thinking about it then. It was pretty much what Flora said. You sit through classroom experiences. Many of them were good, by the way. I mean, I had some... Bill Keene was one of my best props, who, who was the Oakland superintendent, was part-time teaching. Um, so you had some real, you know, good props in the sense that they were traditional professors, and then you had some who were in the field. But it's still not like what we're talking about today. I just wanted to liven this up a little bit. It's, it's to, to, to the points made about performance-based, so that you're really ready. Because <clears throat> you're just, you know, I, I was in the association world for a couple of years. Most folks are really not ready, and I'm speaking... A, if I haven't confessed this before, I mean, I struggled for a couple of years. That you, you just, you don't, some of this you're never going to know you're in the position. But you can be better prepared, and I think this takes us a long way towards that. Yeah. Kathleen? I, I, was gonna, I was just going to say something. Question as well. Yes, Dan. I was going to say something like that, that, you know, central offices used to be, well, sometimes anyway, place where they put people who they didn't know where to put someplace else. 
and they weren't necessarily qualified for the jobs that they had to do. So this really, these standards are really helpful in showing the standards. The central office is important. It's very critical in the in the operation of the district, and we have to have people who are not only knowledgeable about all this, but sensitive to the kind of students they have. And it's just a, it's much harder these days, I think, than it used to be. And uh, it's very important, I think, that we have standards like this. So thank you. You're welcome. Uh, it, by the way, Dan, in a moment, it is much harder. I mean, I, I was try I could tell some of the media was trying to pull me into the debate on the superintendent salaries a week or two ago, and you know, don't you think superintendents shouldn't make more than you? You're this. No, uh, it's fine. You know, these are hard jobs, and uh, I think you know, <clears throat> to the degree a local district thinks someone's worth whatever it is, that's that's up to them. But it is it is harder, and I would just say this that even today with these performance-based standards, it's an evolutionary process. I mean, it's not like magic overnight, mm -hmm. right? This is, this is, but it's great to hear that when you met with the profs that, you know, even though that, that I've been with that group also, they can be uh, quite direct, but they're on the right track already in many respects. That's great to hear. Uh, Dan, you had one. I heard you weigh in. <coughs> I, do. I do. Thank you. Um, I'm pleased to report, by the way, that I've joined the um, half a dozen or so constituents around the state who live stream the meeting. Uh, so I'm, yeah. <laughs> the six people. <laughs> um, I, I have a question about this, the uh, alternative route uh, certification. So it, I pulled up the statutes. I just want to get quick clarification. As I understand it, those have to be offered by a, an established state professional organization under yeah. statute. And the definition of an established state professional organization is an association that has served members on a statewide basis for at least 10 years. Um, I'm wondering, uh, so I, I don't recall us ever having to approve, I'm, just, I'm wondering is there a list of those organizations or associations? I mean, is there a, like how do we know who those folks are? Who could, under this statute, offer an alternatives uh, program? Dan, this is Sally. They're mostly the alphabet soup of the education associations. So you would have the Michigan Association of School Administrators, Michigan Association of Secondary uh, School Principals, the Michigan Elementary and Middle School uh, Principals Association, uh, yeah, the Intermediate School Association. Uh, you've got the MEA, the FT. So there's a variety of those associations that are that are that are established and would probably be the ones most likely to step forward. Is there a master list of all of those associations? There is a list in the Michigan in the MDE directory. Uh, in the back pages, and there's an, a, a whole list of, of even more than those of the education associations. Why don't we um, we'll follow up and get that page to the total board? I would say this, Dan. The the way the law reads, I mean, in theory, someone not listed there could be an association that's been in place for 10 years and then. The, the statute would allow them to make a proposal to uh, Raj and the team. Um, I, I think you're going to see, I'm hopeful from, well, I don't want to say which is, but some associations that are seeing that, well, I'll just say teacher and <coughs> administrator associations who see themselves having a role in, in prep and how they might fit into that, which could be very exciting, you know, as an exciting alternative opportunity. Um, I think. The sense is that many of those would form that in conjunction with existing universities to some degree, but that, you know, that would be for a proposal to, to weigh out. I think the, to the essence of your question, I, um, I think it's very broad the way it's worded in the statute. And I guess theoretically if, uh, pick some letters, uh, the FCZ association came in. I think the gist of what Dan's getting at is that do they have to have some other requirements other than just being 10 years in place? Yeah, well, we have, we have the application um, process, and so when they complete that application, we do have information on there that asks them about um, how long they've been in existence and their association, their membership, and things like that. So we do verify all of that information on the application. And there's a rubric that Raja uses to even look at their programs and review them, you know, to see if they are aligned. What they're saying they're doing is going to be aligned to the standards. So it's not like they can just come in and 
fill out an application and get approved like that. I guess what I'm getting at is could an 11 year association that works with uh, uh, culinary arts to get into this or is there a refined yeah. definition yeah. of what kind of associations that no not no. it's not a statute no. okay Dan and Great. Then, that's wonderful I'd, I'd love to see that list I think it's uh I don't, I don't know that I'm that I have a point at this point but um we just love to explore it a little bit further okay, okay. Richard and Michelle please. follow up on Dan's question um I'm I've been a member of the Lutheran Education Association, which has been around for about 50 years, and we have about 100 Lutheran parochial schools in the state of Michigan. Would this be an association that could provide a professional education program leading to certification? Okay. Okay. I think that's why I was trying to lay the groundwork that it's probably not an exclusive list that Sally's yeah. talking about. That's the, those are the kind of the traditional folks that have been involved, but as a proposal came in. I didn't even know until just now, frankly, that it was strictly just a 10-year requirement. What, on the other hand, what kind of shapes this is the proposal itself and what they plan to do and what expertise they think they bring in to that. Michelle, please. Yeah, um, I just want to say I was looking over the, um, the performance evaluation content. I think it's great. It's a lot of good stuff in there that I think is really good. Oh, thank you. Very good. Um, my question is more with the oversight. Once it's already established, these alternative programs, um, you, how would you ensure that they're, even though they might have a great application, but that and they're in fact doing? Would you have access to data to see what's what they're um, what's going on, and uh, and, or, and would they, if they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing, can you revoke their um, their, their certification? Well, technically, we review programs every five years to ensure that they're actually doing uh, what the application says that they are doing. Um, yearly, we receive annual reports based on how many people they've certified, how many people <laughs> dropped out of the program, uh, different things like that. The difference with the alternate route, though, uh, for example, MASSP, they have individuals that That's are the, secondary the principals. Michigan Association of Secondary School Principals. I'm sorry, I use these okay. acronyms yeah, so much that you forget that some people don't know them. But um, they have a, uh, an assessment component in there. So with the assessment component, that helps kind of tease out that information. Are they getting any better? As soon as they come in, they take a, a pretest. It's not a pretest in the true sense of that, uh, but the post test is a lot of the information that they got in the pretest. So that's showing that they have some growth. So we use that as well as the annual reports, as well as the fact that we can come in at any time. And, and when I say we, I mean the PPD unit or OPPS rather, can come in at any time and look at the program and examine some of the things that they have going on. And is it fair to say that um, the, the the gist of what Michelle is getting at, it's the same for alternative programs as for traditional programs? Yeah. Correct. No Correct. more, no it's less. It's the same for all. We did not want to make a distinction uh, or uh, allow give allowances for either group. We wanted them all to be on the same page. If one group has to meet the standards, the other group also has to meet those standards. Thank you. Uh, I have a question in the process. Sally, you said that you were going to have hearings and then you were going to bring it back to the board for our approval? We will take it to public comments, not public hearings. Comments. Yep. Okay. And then, and then we, we, we will board. take those in consideration and then come back to you with what those comments are and make any, any revisions and, and then come then, back in May. And then how do you actually implement the program? Go ahead. After we approve it. Once you approve um, the standards, then we start to get the institutions in a, a, a schedule a review for those who want to continue their administrative program then we will get them scheduled in um, for review and they have to revise their programs based on how they're going to address these standards and interestingly enough uh, those that were involved in the creation of the current standards have already started changing their programs because they already know what they want mm -hmm. to do so thank you you're welcome and i and and the review process which is common for um, the public comment process what if there were changes to this based on public comment then we would identify those for you in May and say here's here's something that seems to have uh, been consistent in public comment that we recommend we change from what you saw today but otherwise it would be the standards you see today mm -hmm. and this gives a chance for all the you know any public obviously any person as a citizen but also 
um, in the best sense, special interest groups that want to weigh in and feel they haven't been heard yet, um, or even if they have, maybe have thought about it differently. Okay. Thanks, guys. Thanks very much. Great job. And I think you're still here, right? Yes. You're here for item C, and it, it, it's similar <laughs> in one sense. Uh, it, it has a lot of the same characteristics, but it's the Michigan Standards for the Preparation of School Principals as opposed to Central Office Administrators. So turn it right over to Sally. And you will see a, a lot of similarity between the central office and the building principal uh, standards, and the PowerPoints are also very, very similar. Um, so Raj will walk you through the, the oh, new standards for school principals. It, it will sound like a, a repetition uh, because the process was the same. Uh, the content, though, is different. Uh, the standards are different. They are building level standards. So again, in, in Coming together, I have to say, when I first started the, um, the revision of the new standards, I went back home. Uh, again, Flint is my home. It's where I'm from. It's my community. It's where is that? Home. Where are you from? Flint, Michigan. No, I'm not. <laughs> Flint. Flint. Excuse the question. I know. I'm just <laughs> <laughs> but uh, <laughs> proud hometown. I don't blame you. I know. I carry it with me wherever I go. You and Marty, I by the I way. Mean, yeah. It's it, actually I was just there this weekend and. I went to my hometown, and, and I mean, actually my, my neighborhood, and uh, I was a little disheartened uh, because everything that I knew as a child and I carried with me is gone. So uh, that's why I do what I do. So it, it's, this is one of those days for me. But when I stepped to the table with these standards, I thought about the principles that are in that area and some of the rural areas, and I wanted to give them standards that would help them, even our newer principals come out to uh, really understand some of the challenges that they will face in any school. Uh, there are challenges in any school, whether it's rural, inner city, or suburban. But we again outlined the principles and foundations for preparing building level administrators. Uh, we looked at program development and assessment of candidates. And that's one of the things that we were really, really weak on in our uh, current programs. Not all of them, uh, but some of them were um, just generating principles but not really showing that they could perform. Uh, and that was a, even in the internship, and that's another thing that I'm working on currently for these standards, is to have an internship that is of quality, that shows performance, that they can actually link back to what they already learned in the coursework that they've completed. Um, again, we wanted these to be performance <laughs> and outcome-based programs. We wanted them to have that integrator reliability because anyone cre can create a rubric. The question is, is have we shown that rubric to other people and allowed them to use it, and have they given you feedback on that rubric to show that it has that greater iterator reliability? And that's one of the things that we wanted to do in, this, in the standards. Also, again, the disposition measures. Um, there's this question uh, that I asked of the stakeholder group, and our stakeholder group for uh, school level uh, administrators was made up of uh, alternate route and traditional preparation programs. And one of the things that we really looked at is do our standards really show um, or kind of reflect the policies and practices in education? And um, we wanted to make that connection clear in the principal preparation standards. So we examined, again, the policies and practices impacting educator preparation, uh, created a, a connected system to the preparation and continuous prep, uh, professional learning. So what you'll see in the future, for example, if you go through a preparation program for teacher prep, it's semi-preparing you for what you'll see in school leadership or teacher leadership. Teacher leadership, um, it's a proposal, but it kind of has some of those same elements. And in school administrator, uh, excuse me, school principal level standards, you'll see that connection between all of those. So we really wanted to make that happen. Again, we examined the uh, Interstate School Leaders Licensure Consortium Standards, uh, which are called the ISLIC Standards. The stakeholder feedback, and that stakeholder feedback came from, again, the Michigan Association of Professors of Educational Administration, MAPEA, um, other uh, deans and, and uh, professors in the field, um, and actually some, if, uh, some people from this very office. Uh, the state superintendent, state board of education, and governor priorities were also considered, as well as best practices within principal preparation. And this was looking at even the 21st century uh, uh, 
I'm trying to remember what it's called, the 21st Century School Administrator. I'm sure many of you are familiar with that. It has a, a lot of really good information on there, especially the technology component. So we really looked at those. So we, we examined a lot of different aspects of uh, being a school principal. So again, the technology initiative, we really wanted to drive that point home. Uh, we didn't want it to make it its separate standard, but we really wanted to drive it home throughout all of the standards. How can technology improve a building? How can it help with uh, services? How can it help improve processes in the building? Um, a good example is my son, who's actually in the military now. Uh, he, um, when he would do things he wasn't supposed to do in, at school, we all got those calls, but we got this automatic call from the Grambling school system that came through. A, a uh, student so-and-so and so was not in class on this day, so it was interesting to see that type of technology come through, and those are the types of things that we're talking about. Can technology improve practice, curriculum, and instruction? Um, career and college readiness outcomes, and focus on individual learners. And again, these are national professional standards. Although it's not in the name, these are professional standards for school administrators. I had to make that point known. They are professional standards. These um, standards are divided into seven groups. Again, school district vision, as you can see, there is some similarity between the central office administrator standards and the building level administrator standards. School district and culture, school district management, organization, operation, and resources, school district collaboration with faculty and community members, uh, district ethics, uh, success for every student by understanding and responding to advocating for a student learning. And again, uh, standard three, I will not read this to you. I will not bore you with those details. It's kind of similar to the previous standard, uh, but it is the building level uh, component. So again, content, knowledge, and performance. And these are actually being used now by some of our uh, traditional uh, programs. They use these actually when they're doing professional learning. <laughs> they're offering um, professional development for school administrators. I know some of the associations are using these uh, current standards. And the actually NCATE uses ELCC. They use the ELCC SPA for accreditation. So again, many of our institutions have, are already familiar with ELCC. They're on board for it. And we did, again, make a few changes. Uh, we incorporated teacher leadership, we incorporated technology, we incorporated the achievement gap components, um, a few other things. But you'll see it when you actually look at the standards. So it is content, knowledge, and performance based. Um, these are used for initial principal preparation. Um, are, and let me say this, the principal programs are master's level programs. The central office are uh, specialist PhD EDD level programs. Um, the alternate route is a, uh, it's a program, let me just say that, it is a program uh, and that I believe that, again, we only have one approved at this point, so I really don't have anything to compare it to, but we only have one approved at this point, and it is a very rigorous approval process. And could you so mention for a moment what might seem like a paradox, that how is something approved if we're just doing the standards now? It's approved on the basis of? Correct. It is approved. You got it. Based on current, based based on on current existing. existing. And they will have to update their standards just like Correct. a traditional uh, uh, teacher prep institution or Correct. Uh, EPI. All programs would. will Correct. have to reapply for approval to offer a certification program in uh, central office and principal preparation. If anything, I think I heard you say months ago that, that, uh, that there are institutions that have gotten ahead of this on their own anyway, as you said today. But in the case of the secondary principals, they were pretty much performance-based the way they introduced this, even in their original. Yeah. Correct. So they might have less than some institutions in trying to adapt to the new standards. Correct. Correct. Yeah. And there you have it, the um, school-based administrator standards. And again, the process will be the same. We'll take them out for public comment. Um, if there's any revisions, uh, like Mike said, that there <coughs> seems to be a theme that we need to revise them, we'll make those revisions, notify you of what those revisions are, and then ask you for approval in May. Mm -hmm. Comments I, or questions from uh, board? You know, I Kathleen? Just, I wanted to say, I, I don't know if uh, Michelle and Lupe know that, I don't know how many years ago now, eight, maybe seven, eight, 
years ago, we had five task forces we thought we needed to do to have good schools. One was uh, assuring ed effective educators, excellent educators, that was uh, geared to teachers. We had one on principals, and we had one on early childhood education. We had one on uh, school community relations. And what was the fifth? Right. So principals, we be, then we tried to get principals certified because they had decertified, they'd taken away the requirement for certification when they passed the charter school authorization bills. So we were very concerned that we have excellent principals because the principal sets the tone of the school and is a key player. Now we're putting a lot of emphasis, everybody says we have to have good teachers in front of every classroom, which we do. But the principal is also, I think, key to the, how the school works. I've been in schools where you have good ones and where you don't. Mm -hmm. And it's such a difference. I mean, you can walk into a school and you know the principal is no good. If the, if the principal is no good, it's so evident. And if the principal is good, you know that too. I mean, it's just astonishing to me that it's so obvious. So it's important that since we pushed for the certification of, t of principals that we have good standards of what we're working with. So I hope the, the teacher prep and the, these colleges of education will really use these. As we talked about implementing it, a lot of the things we do, we don't know how they're implemented. That's part of, part of a problem that we have, but uh, it's, it's critical. So it's very important that we continue to emphasize these standards. Michelle, thank you. Um, uh, I had a question. Um, so I know you talked to the professors and the deans and things. Was there an opportunity to talk to actual principals? Um, uh -huh. principal so you also had that in the formation of this? Okay, because you didn't mention that, and I thought, or even teaching organization about what makes a good principal or what should be. But or is that, but then I understand that's going to happen now after, too, right? Correct. So, Correct. Um, and uh, the other thing I was just looking through to see, um, I know there's general um, references to understanding the law as being inclusive, but um, and maybe I've missed it. Is there is there a particular um, curriculum on special education that, because I think it's critical, so many principals, especially now that they're doing all this mainstreaming, and people don't really understand what the rules are and what is required. <coughs> so is there a component in here dedicated to Focus on special education? Well, I figured one of you would ask me that, so I'm already prepared for okay, you. Okay, <laughs> Well, again, these are preparation standards for uh, being a school administrator, right. okay? Um, and we had to, the more we changed them, the less they became national standards. So what I'm doing is creating an appendix to accompany the standards for things such as that. And the, um, the lucky thing that I have is special ed is right around the corner for me. So I've been talking to special ed, I've been talking to uh, coordinated school health, career tech ed, um, and one more early childhood, did I say early childhood? Yeah. Uh, those groups I'm actually talking to to try to, because we had to talk to them in the past in order to produce the letters to go out uh, regarding school administrator certification and how that affects them. So in the appendix you will see those connections to special ed and other groups. Joe. Sorry, we're getting, I'll tell you in a moment, we're getting organized on something else. I, you <laughs> caught me, teacher. Thank you. <laughs> Good to get a teacher's point of view. <laughs> I was, yeah. Well, not by high school, but yeah. I was just looking through this, and I really appreciate the standard 3.4 that you have here. Uh -huh. Candidates understand and can develop school capacity for distributed leadership. Um, over the years at my school, I've really seen the change in the culture of school that can make when a principal sees leadership qualities in his teachers and can distribute that as well as talking about in involving school staff in the decision making process and in that buy in. So I, I really appreciate that standard and I think that's something that all principals need to kind of relinquish some of the um, leadership that they feel that they have onto their staff which can make good changes. 
Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yes. Okay, well, uh, I, I submit you with these standards because having taught as long as I did, uh, we always felt we had to be highly qualified, mm. but the educational leader did not. And so we had problems when they came to evaluate us, mm -hmm. and they were not highly qualified. <coughs> so this is uh, uh, music to my ears. Uh, now, is there timeline when uh, school districts have to comply with the new standards. Well, again, these are actually these are preparation standards uh, for programs. Oh, before they even start. Right. Correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. But I think, in the spirit of what you're asking, I mean, if I was a local superintendent again, or, uh, or I would be over time looking for principal inst principal training institutions mm -hmm. that got us the kind of principals that were getting results. And just think about what's going to be ha able to happen with all the data out there right now. You know, you still need principals that have kind of the soft skills in the best sense. But you also need principals that are going to be able to show, given the high accountability, whether you're in favor or not, it's the law, you know, no matter where we may stand on that, that are actually getting student achievement growth. And I, th I could see not long into the future where you not only, since we have top, so-called top-to-bottom lists on schools, 4,000 schools, you could, an interested journalist, and we have some here today, could probably dig down into that data and say, hmm, interesting, the Central Michigan tends to produce principles that get the most student achievement growth. Mm -hmm. You know, they're going to, it might defy the image that we have of certain institutions or that Association X isn't doing a good job on that. You know that it's, it's it's so. In addition to what our folks talked about in terms of our own review, there's also I think going to be public review of this. Just it's going to invite it, so that you would, because before I you know I hired probably 30 or 40 principals in in, in my time there, and you, you didn't have the kind of information to know. It was more, you know, we did team interviews so that get another perspective from a teacher that was going to be in the building also, not just me as superintendent then. But you, you didn't really know for sure what you were getting. And I just think some of this is going to open the door more and more to measures that should be part of your consideration, not your only consideration. So to that degree, it's beyond the prep institutions. Well, what happens with the principals that are there already and don't have these standards? Are they grandfathered in, or do they have to go back and acquire the standards? They, they don't have to go back, but what we are emphasizing is that this is a continuous um, preparation or, or professional learning model. So the same standards that we're using for preparation can also be used in professional learning. So once they have their certificate, they have it, but they do have to maintain it by doing the professional learning every five years. There's so many credits that they would have to do. So the, so the renewal is going to, in effect, involve some of this. Yes, because when, when the highly effective uh, clause came into play, I was not considered highly effective. And I had to go back and prepare a uh, portfolio, whatever, what, so I could continue teaching. And I had been teaching you know, quite a few years. So this but I guess I am saying that. Yeah. Yeah. I Michelle. I just wanted to, so my, I had a concern with something you brought up, Mike. Um, just to make sure I understand things. So you're, you're suggesting that it could be that you look at the test scores of students to see whether a principal prep program is effective? Is that what that was your well, first of all, I said journalists, but I'm just thinking what's going to happen is th what we have now okay. is, let's say, to Deb's point earlier, the ravishing Deb, that there are so-called bottom 5%, and it's largely based on, on growth. Well, it is. I mean, there is clearly a correlation that we all, that's one reason, by the way, that we appreciate the board. Uh, working with us last year in the retreat on the major goal we have this year, which is the gap, right. because the gap issue largely is directly related to poverty. Right. On the other hand, there's beating the odds schools with the exact same poverty that have beat the odds, and they're not, they're performing, they're outperforming. Mm -hmm. 
But where I'm getting at is, so you look at the existing system now, in a way, the, bot, the so-called bottom 5% used to be called persistently lost achieving, often correlated to poverty, as you say. But there's a high level of accountability, even to the degree of takeover, as we know, with the recent legislation that's before us now on EAA and everything else. And so you can just envision where suddenly, let's say the, the 4,000 principals that are in the 4,000 schools, there's going to be data available to show where they are on the top to bottom list. And, and that and top to bottom list is based on test scores, right? It's a hybrid. It's not just okay. test. It's a hybrid. Not, it, not we, just test scores? We could review that at some time, okay. but it's a complicated, okay. in large part, yeah, in large part it's, what we do that some states don't do that we got approved uh, even before the waiver, I think, was we have we have credit for growth. Because what we wanted to be able to do was, okay, why would you, let's just say a principle, why would you go into a school that has so much difficulty right out of the block because kids haven't been read to whatever, the, right. the issues related to poverty, if you're not given credit for growth. <coughs> so the measures that we have on a so-called top to bottom list give a fair amount of credit for growth, where some states it's purely um, raw test scores. And in fact, by the way, one reason we, we felt and still feel it's good to have uh, as best we can a relationship with all the parties involved, including the governor and the legislature, is we got, we were the ones that single-handedly got in before the bill was introduced, um, uh, growth into the language of the law. Remember before that it was, it was inferring raw test scores, so raw test scores is an unfair uh, measure and we wanted to give credit. So I, okay. I, I just want to, you know, I just, I just wanted to make sure that, um, well, or just to put on the record that I have a serious concern with um, using test scores of students to evaluate principles um, because I think <laughs> they're, they're somewhat detached from that. I think there's a lot of things that you know, result in low test scores, namely, you know, it's the socioeconomic folks. And then, you know, I, I work at Wayne State, and Wayne State prepares a lot of people <coughs> for the state. It's a high poverty district. So I think it would be, um, it would look, <laughs> it would put some uh, uh, prep programs that uh, train, you know, uh, students in a certain, for urban education or whatever, would put them in a more difficult or in, in an unfair light um, because the I, because I think the evaluation system is flawed. Number one, because I think I don't think the test scores is a um, is a is a fair uh, method of evaluating uh, performance. But but I also think it would skew in uh, in a way um, that I think is much more complicated and um, and uh, I would hope that that standard wouldn't be incorporated into uh, principles or into uh, uh, criteria for grading or evaluating principles. Not that you were suggesting it, but I was saying I hope that that's not the direction it goes in. Yeah. No, you're making, you're making an excellent point about institutions that almost do, um, you know, I don't want to make this really, almost, I was going to say the Lord's work, or makes, makes you know, does things that they know puts them at a disadvantage because they're preparing to be specific urban right. urban teachers right. and principals. And we are taking that. It's one reason we wanted the growth in there. But I would say this, that um, I, I still think one of the things that will be looked at, I'm not saying as part of a, an evaluation, will right. be how do you trigger, how do you go back to institutions of preparation, whether it's teacher or administrator, and try to get some relative understanding of how they're doing. They're going to definitely do it with teacher evaluations, whether we like it or not. They're they're right. going to they're going to show not to because the teacher evaluations are, as you know, uh, and as some of us would say, over uh, maybe was an overreach to the degree, but it it is what it is. And also, um, just for the audience, I know the board's aware of this, but uh, probably most of the audience, this all derives from two administrations in a row, the Bush and the Obama administration, using test scores and requiring us to do so. Mm -hmm. So this isn't like we just pulled this out of the air. Uh, and I know you're not inferring that. So, But yeah, I appreciate you giving me a chance to clarify that because I would agree that shouldn't be an evaluation component. I just think sooner or later you're going to see people saying, 
Well, how does Central measure against Eastern, measure against Wayne State, and then hopefully they're going to take into account, journalists is why I said journalists, the, the issues that you and I very much agree on. That some, you know, if, I probably shouldn't say this hearing all that U of M support earlier, but, and I don't mean U of M alone, but if you have, if you are very selective in candidates that you take, you are at an advantage. This isn't to take away from the work they do, but you're at an advantage, and there's going to be ways to still say, well, even with that advantage, is there growth? Mm -hmm. But uh, if we didn't have the institutions that were ready to step up and take a full array of backgrounds into their program, like Wayne State does, we'd be in big trouble. We couldn't just have institutions that are just taking so-called elite kids. Uh, we wouldn't be able, for one thing, we have a hundred and some thousand teachers, you know, and we just couldn't couldn't fill the ranks. John, I think you had one of them, Richard. I guess, um, well, to the degree that we, are, in a constructive, thoughtful, effective way, are all focusing <coughs> what we do to prepare principals, educators around the ultimate goal of improving student outcomes and achievement, if that can be done well, I think it's a, it's a healthy piece. I, I, I do believe, I, I want to say, I think the evaluation of administrators and principals, just as the evaluation of teachers, is part of the charge of the Governor's Council on Education Effectiveness, right? Mm -hmm. So the Deb Ball group right. is, I think, very thoughtfully and constructively figuring out how best to, with the input of teachers, teachers' unions, and uh, educators, administrators, figure out what could a good evaluation look like that was supportive and helpful and, th and well-designed uh, for both administrators and um, educators that, that they co-create, that they buy into, that does include uh, student performance, you know, as, as a piece of that. So I think we're going to hear from Deb in a couple months. Uh, she made an interim report that she sent to all of us, and that would be a great issue to explore further. How are we going to do this in a way that is very constructive, very supportive, but also does focus the skills of administrators and teachers on student achievement and growth? So more than test score, right? When you well, say student achievement and growth, it's more than just the test score. I mean, I, yeah. the test scores are part of the the complex of how we look at. So, I, I really trust their process and their can about how to do this well with the input of teachers and administrators. What is the right portfolio uh, of 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 information that you want to use and how do you use it? Uh, and I'm you know I'm hopeful that that will be a very good, robust, supportive uh, evaluation. Um, you know, a, a evaluation tools, technology, whatever they come out with. And, and I'm just going to clarify my point one step further. Beyond the evaluation of the folks in schools, I, I do believe, I'm going to just say it, I know deans are not always happy with me, my thinking about this, but they pretty much don't have skin in the game. Teachers are highly, highly accountable now, in my view, to a fault that they can't control a lot of the issues. Principles, very much to the same degree as you're inferring. We need to make sure the whole system has skin in the game here, including the prep institutions, and I think this is a step in that direction, and I, I absolutely agree. There can be unfair, uh, and, and I think John's on point, that, that Deborah Ball, who I think we're going to be able to get in May, by the way, we're looking for having her join us, could put, she gets that very much the things you're saying, and I think is bringing that kind of leadership. I'm not defending grading, uh, evaluating teachers on test scores either. I'm just, because we're talking about principles, I was just focused on, yeah. on the principles. Yes, sir. And, and I thought I'd just comment. I, I think that, uh, uh, as I mentioned before, quality is not two-dimensional. I think that uh, there will always be a place for multiple uh, teacher and, and um, uh, administrator preparation programs that have different emphases, different strengths, because mm -hmm. I think the terrain out there is, is very different and uh, rural schools may find that one, one institution uh, seems to generate folks that are acquainted with their specific uh, needs and, and skills and urban schools may find a similar uh, uh, institution is more, has got a program that's more tuned to their particular needs. So I, uh, my concern is as we look at quality, we not straight jacket. Uh, uh, and eliminate the diversity of emphasis and philosophy that I think would be a benefit to our schools. Makes sense. Quick comment? Yes, Dan. 
Um, I, this is wonderful conversation. I'm sure we'll have a time, though, to revisit the issue of evaluation of the performance of teachers and school leaders um, at another time. We've obviously got stuff coming down the pipe uh, um, from uh, Dean Ball's uh, work and the, and the rest of the uh, Committee on Educator Effectiveness uh, and so on. Um, so I just wanted to turn attention back to these standards um, and thank uh, Flora and team for presenting. Um, I do think the work is, is good and looking forward to having it come back in front of us uh, after it's had a chance for public comment. Right. Thank, you. thank you, Dan. Okay, thanks. Actually, uh, Mike, I had to let you know that um, I don't know if you know this about me, but I'm from Flint, Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for clarifying that. You and Marty, I mean, I hear it all. Uh, I did know that. Pr proud res former residents. Um, we thought, John, one reason, and I got caught by the Teacher of the Year that we were, we were, we were organizing here. No, it was on me, but. It, we were kind of. Uh, now they do it with text, so you don't quite get caught. But I, um, we thought we'd crunch through a few of the items that, since we have some time, and so thereby I'm going to call to order the regular meeting of the board. The time is now 11:29, and a quorum of the board is present. The state board of ed meeting of March 12, 2013, is called to order. Um, and we're going to jump to, I, I know Mertz and John agreed on a few items here. Okay. So I'm going to just defer to Susan because she looks more organized than I feel right at this moment. We're going to P. We're not going. <laughs> we're going to item. We're going to item P. I beg your pardon. <laughs> that for sure is a fossil statement. Yeah. <laughs> uh, to expedite, we're going to look at these three items as one item. Um, they are the quality standards for pre-kindergarten and the quality standards for infant and toddler, as well as the Michigan out-of-school time standards. All three of these groups of standards were presented to you, two in November and one in January, and they have gone out for public comment. And so they're coming back to you now for approval. Wendy? We, um, we were very pleased with the public comment on all three of the sets of standards. The majority of it was very, very um, just not down. loud enough. Oh, red means off, I guess. <laughs> uh, the comment on all three sets of standards was very positive. We got many, many thank yous. We like the way you did this. This is um, up to date. There were a few suggestions that we took that uh, we thought improved the standards. In the pre-K standards, uh, they asked that we, uh, we were playing around with a fancy name for one of the domains and, and the overwhelming majority of people thought we, would, we should return to approaches to learning rather than dimensions of learning or ecology of learning and that the national title is approaches to learning so that keeps us in line even if it's not precisely the right word it does keep us in line with the national thinking. We revised the introduction and they suggested that we take the coding that aligned the standards to the Head Start Child's Outcome Framework out of the body of the document and provide it separately that it was distracting to the reader. So uh, we thought those were pretty good um, suggestions for that one. On the uh, infant uh, toddler programs, um, there were just some minor changes where we'd made some technical errors on the levels of some endorsements, <laughs> so we fixed those up. And on the out-of-school time standards, the recommendation was um, to reorganize the introduction. We didn't actually take any information out. We just put it in a different order. And we didn't change any standards. So for the most part, what you're seeing is what went out for public comment with a few technical changes on all three items. And we're uh, asking you to approve those today. 
then we can move forward with formatting, graphic design, um, the sort of there's some built-in professional development on examples, and um, then we also have a project to develop some suggestions for professional development more completely and some parent materials. So maybe are there general questions for the three? We can still go back to specifics when we when we bring each item up for uh, 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 approval. So in that spirit, any general or comments? Uh, Kathleen? So I'd move approval first and then we can there, okay. discuss. P, I mean, there's three of them, so we'll do one at a time. P is um, oh, okay. is the approval of early childhood. I was just doing out of school time at this point. Excuse me. I th I was just thinking of the out of school time at this point. But we can do whatever, however you we want to do that. We can do that one first, here. right? Well, let's do that. If that's on, so that's R, which is approval of Michigan out of school time. And I hear a motion from Kathleen Strauss, Second. supported by Lupe. Um, any any discussion? The comments sounded good. <laughs> they were very helpful. I right. mean, you know, we did make some changes uh, in the document to make sure that it applied K-12. In the past, it was only K-8, and the comments were positive about that. Mm -hmm. okay. Other, other committee did a good job. From board. All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, same. Thank you about approval of early childhood standards of quality for pre-kindergarten so P. Supported by Lupe. Work supported by John. Discussion by the board. All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, same. Okay. And Q is approval of early childhood standards of quality for infant and toddler programs. Is there a motion? So moved. Okay. Supported by Eileen. Further discussion? All in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed, same. I think already our audience heard this in the beginning, but these have been before the board before. That's why this this isn't this is the second time. So thank you. Thanks, thank Mertz. You. Appreciate that. And I think Mertz was suggesting there's one other that we might want to Carol, can we do S? Yeah, no, that'd be good, Carol. So this this SS item, this S item, is the approval of State Board of Ed and Michigan Department of Education co-sponsorship of uh, a school nutrition association conference. Unless you're anti-nutrition, we probably would be okay with it, but giving the somewhat self-explanatory. It's, it's, it's endorsing and co-sponsoring there. <laughs> Kyle, did you want to speak to anything? This is item S, correct? Yes, item S. Yeah. 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 For board members, this is item S. Yeah. I move approval of item S. Moved by John. Support. Supported by Richard. Any further discussion? All in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed, same. Thank you. That was easy. <laughs> Eleanor is coming up. Eleanor has made it. And I, you know, I yes, I did. And we're, this is item M. Sorry, we're jumping around here a little bit, but this is. Uh, no, no take that it's back. not M. It's item. Oh. Oh. It's O. Oh. Oh. So, oh. Oh. <laughs> so O is. This is one we've had on a few times, but I think we're in shape today. I think the board uh, has helped us get it to this point. It's the approval of the three at-large nominations to the Special Education Advisory Committee. Eleanor, would you like to just prep that for a moment? Okay. Well, I think we talked about it a little bit last time because SEAC is made up of organizational membership as well as at-large members, and we work diligently to try to have 51% of our organization of SEAC 
to be what we call defined members, and that means they either have a disability or they're a parent of a child or guardian of a child with a disability. So we're working toward that now. Um, and we, uh, it was mentioned last time that we need to have diversity, and so we made sure that we took a look at, at making uh, a chart so that you could see that we had representation across the state in terms of diversity, as well as ethnic and racial diversity. Um, SEAC is very important to the Board of Education because it is advisory, not just to the Office of Special Education, but the Michigan Department of Education. And they work in, in making sure that they have, um, that they look at unmet needs, as well as looking at any issues that they'd like to bring forward to the Board of Education. I'll be more than happy to answer any questions that you might have. Any questions or comments by board members? Is there a motion? The approval of the uh, nominations to SEAC. Second. Yes, it was moved by Kathleen, supported by Michelle. Any further discussion? All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, same. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. And John mentioned that you might want to do your report. Yeah, Is that? We're going to try to wait till noon till we break. Is that a good time so we can get people? Yeah, because for the audience, uh, Cassandra's joining us, well, through lunch and after lunch, um, and obviously as chair of the legislative committee, we want to spend some time on that this afternoon. So we're moving around some of these items for that item, for that reason. And, um, I did note, uh, we will have the chance to visit with Deb Ball and, uh, and my, I personally am encouraged and want to be supportive of their work uh, towards, I wish we had it today because we're sort of in an interim period of having to do evaluations with various criteria but not having a really effective, thoughtful one and as a model or different models. So um, two things I just wanted to raise briefly. One, you know, we, we have had a, a number, including last night, of these uh, forums and there are a number more coming up. And there's also others who are eager to help organize them. Uh, we have to figure out how many of these we can execute. I, I do think it's, it's, there certainly is a great desire and, and there's a lot of eager participation in them um, as we are, I think in each one a little differently, but generally the, the format is to try to share some perspective from our perspective and allow local educators on what we've been in up to what we've been attempting to focus on and some of the major things that we all agree on and are trying to advance, whether it's the Michigan Merit Curriculum or uh, teacher preparation, early childhood, but also to try to name and, and at least share perspective, and sometimes those perspectives differ, and we have different people. Like last night, we had Peter Riddell and David Arson of MSU sharing different perspectives a bit on uh, some of the school choice, school finance ideas that began to circulate through the Oxford Foundation last year. And, and for each, and for board members to share some of their perspective uh, with as much uh, uh, agreement as we can on, on where we share a perspective, but also to share individual perspectives. But it's been a very, I think, healthy education and healthy uh, encouragement of the kind of public attention and public engagement with these issues. And, and so I, I do believe it's a, a very useful thing for the board to help convene and or participate in where they uh, have been happening. We, we have, I know, one scheduled for Marquette, May 6th. We have next week Macomb, we have Port Huron, and Grand Rapids. Lupe, did you, did yes. we fix the date for Grand Rapids? It's in May, because most May people go May 9th? Yes. Oh, good, okay. <laughs> I needed that. <laughs> Wait a minute, you just said May 8th? May 6th is the UP Marquette. with the Marquette RISA facilitating okay, uh, participation so by many. So is that enough time? To get the back from the UP, <laughs> they have built a bridge. As I listen to the logistics of State Board of Ed travel to meet this, uh, where is it going to be on the website? The uh, meeting. Uh, yeah, Marty has uh, begun to post them in kind of a rolling roster on our State Board. With a hyperlink. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And hopefully. Thanks. we'll locations and meeting times and great as we get them solidified so May 9th you're targeting for Grand Rapids right four to six some at the community college is that yes. and then 
We are we are getting more requests, major ones from Lansing area, Novi. So I, I leave it open how many of these people would like to do. If there's a stomach for it, um, or mm -hmm. not that's not the right word. Meaning just how many of these can we physically yeah, do? Yeah. Right. People would eagerly uh, help put them together. So um, we can see if board members are interested. And I know Kathy's trying mm -hmm. to uh, nail down the Detroit one as well. Um, Karen can help you with that scheduling. Uh, <laughs> Uh, right. Phraseology, because it really, it really <laughs> is. A we want to be door <laughs> openers, not door <laughs> slammers. Right. right. Uh, and I'd also like to say that I think the conversation was richer last night for having the uh, having several more sides presented. So as these, obviously we have a 6-2 board, there's only two Republicans, and it's not that we don't share uh, all of the same viewpoints as Democrats, but we do have other talking points, and I think it really helped the audience. So um, it's easy to schedule the six people, it's harder to schedule the two. Uh, there's, we're crunchy peanut butter, you guys are smooth, uh, because there's more of you. So if we can pay attention to that, though, in the upcoming uh, uh, events, and try to get some uh, balance and, uh, and representation. You know, I'm not only eager to do that, I would like to make sure we, we do that as much as we can and you know have kind of uh, different perspectives be shared uh, I was at one that wasn't on our list that the Midland folks put together where Michael Van Beek of the Mackinac Center was there uh, and that was a healthy you know and, and constructive uh, exchange and, and information session so um, the other thing I will we'll talk about legislation this afternoon um, I do I am very hopeful and appreciate that there's the good work of the legislative committee and everybody. There's, it sounds like a real um, important need for us to, in multiple ways, be active and reinforce and, and I hope adopt the resolution supporting the Michigan Merit Curriculum. And Sally and others noted, we might add a, a uh, an element that affirms our commitment to the Common Core, because apparently the anti-Common Core folks are arising in the legislature, and I think we need to make a very strong statement and be active in in explaining with others help mm -hmm. the importance of the kind of uh, common core and rigor that is uh, competencies for all our young people, the paths towards work, futures that uh, those serve, and graduation as the data shows. So I hope we'll, we'll do that. Um, the thoughtful statement that we'll take up on online learning, uh, informed by best practices, our support for it, if it can be done in ways that we know can be most fruitful for helping kids learn. And so I appreciate that. I, I recommended the EA legislation is um, is before the legislature. I, I, I do not believe we have a uh, shared uh, uh, point of view as a board. That we have very very different opinions about that legislation overall and in detail. So what I would encourage us to do is uh, not uh, attempt to uh, make a shared statement. Often when we can, I'm delighted when we can speak together, but that board members have a chance to share their perspective on uh, the issues, concerns, and or um, things they believe are, are good and or need more work or improvement in the EA legislation when we talk this afternoon. Well, I presume we'll have a discussion of that when we get to legislation. Right. That's. I'm just okay. flagging it. Uh, just I wanted to, to mm -hmm. note that. And I, I didn't appreciate, I gather, the uh, Richard McClellan did communicate to Lisa Lyons, the House Chair, that uh, House Bill 5923 uh, should not be reintroduced and was uh, um, crediting me uh, maybe uh, overly with, uh, with uh, my overreaching and criticizing it, but I, uh, I, I think I'm pleased if, if there's some realization that that c complex of new school creation, which I still am not sure from whence it came. Yeah. Apparently it was posted online and someone gave it to me last night and it's on the Oxford Foundation website. Um, I do think it represented a, a pretty overly aggressive effort to create with not inequality and not much thought uh, a whole new market for education and so I'm not disappointed if it's not coming back. His letter apparently says we'll have to find ways to build this into the school finance stuff in other ways. But I also I just wanted to note for the record when I was at that forum with Michael Van Peek of the Mackinac Center, I was asking, Michael, where did this stuff come from? It was in House Bill 5923. He goes, I do not know where it came from. I think Richard conjured as many things as he could that, uh, from where he wanted to go. And, and Michael said uh, he thought it was a bad piece of legislation. And so I feel comfortable if I'm not outflanking the Mackinac Center in criticizing it uh, as it was proposed. So I'm glad if it's not coming back in any form. But I am eager to find ways we can 
support and reshape ideas about uh, expanded choice, uh, spending money, uh, creating new schools. I'm very much on record of supporting all sorts of new school variants, including ones that business or partnerships with business, et cetera, if they're done as part of quality innovation in a, in a public school context that makes it richer and more effective, doesn't create a, a potentially destabilizing marketplace for education that doesn't deliver quality and doesn't, uh, uh, and meanwhile, saps uh, resources from the existing schools. So. Uh, I just wanted to note that. I was unaware of that until yesterday. But I think we as a board will need to continue to be thoughtful and active on pieces of legislation and ideas that emerge around the new school creation and school finance uh, ideas that, that are being repackaged, I, I gather, as we speak. Thanks, John. I can do mine then, too, in that timeline, I think. Uh, by the way, the the Lori Higgins, I know, is one, and other le journalists watch in, as Dan's doing today, fairly regularly. They got a headline here, John and Mackinac Center on the same page. Um, in terms of Common Core, uh, coincidentally, I wrote a letter. I very rarely do this. I try to save my, keep my powder dry or whatever the expression is, but to the Detroit News on the Common Core, and we'll see if they publish it. I, it, it it's a defense of what I think is an appropriate defense of the Common Core. And, uh, Wait, I, I, yeah, Mike into the mic. I was saying I, I, John brought up the Common Core. I coincidentally wrote a letter to the Detroit News. Uh, as they took a pretty aggressive stance on the Common Core, and I wrote one, which I don't often do. In fact, I very rarely write anything like that and just thought this needed some attention in terms of how it came about, the advantages of it, why we were already pretty much there anyway as a state with the work done here at the board table. Um, so, you know, I'm hopeful they'll print that and we'll see. Um, but I think John's on target that we still need to be vigilant and watch for legislation related to that and then have a full discussion here. You know, I mean, I think it's still the, – the second thing is um, uh, I said overreach earlier. I should – on teacher evaluation, I think there's a role for teacher evaluations. The overreach part I wanted to clarify a little bit is I think the timing – of not letting us do a dev ball type approach first and then implement this that, that is the problem. We have a lot of districts struggling. We got some criticism, as you know, we being the institution of public education that, quote, so few teachers uh, were listed as ineffective in the, in the, uh, in, in of the 100,000 last year. First of all, I, the hope is that that's accurate. You know, that would be great. But to the degree that the system is is quite uh, penalty driven, um, if I were a principal now, I would I would want a uh, a system I could hang my hat on better, which I think will come from the dead ball experience before I would take a leap like that. So I think part of what's going on, because the intent of giving a less than effective uh, designation is for improvement, not for punishing. Right. And it's to, you know, we're all ineffective in some areas uh, and can use improvement. So, but I think it's, that was the danger of jumping, probably no malice, but jumping ahead the timeline on getting those done last year when we really haven't given instruments that uh, districts can use with confidence. Some have invented on their own, some good ones. Um, the, there's been the allowance of some pilot programs that are in place, as you know, but ultimately I think this will really be why it's interesting to have Deb here and probably in May. And that's the part I meant about overreach, not that there shouldn't be some kind of accountability for all of us. And then I was going to speak a little bit ironically about the teacher prep, and I jumped ahead of it a little bit here, that I just, I think, first of all, you know, I can come off sour sometimes when I don't mean to, that we have, uh, we're lucky, we've got 32 of the best teacher prep and educator prep institutions in the country, and literally they're exporters all over the place. So it's all in this spirit of can we all get better, not that we're bad. And um, in fact, I've made myself available to the deans, I think it's in April, uh, to kind of discuss issues related to that. And I think that that does mine, and maybe we could just do the, um, teacher of the year? I'm sorry? The teacher of the year? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I was going to Yeah. Laugh, so <laughs> give me sure, one. Sure, that would. 
if you want, while Bobby Joe is pulling that up, did you, the part I skipped over uh, accidentally was the approval of State Board of Ed minutes, item D, which are the improvement, uh, approval of minutes of regular and committee of the whole meeting of February 12th. And are there any, uh, well, first of all, is there a motion to support? Approval by John, moved, seconded by Michelle. Are there any corrections or additions? All in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed, same. And I'll move approval of the minutes from the closed session we had on February 12th with our attorneys. With the attorneys. So it's moved by John, supported by Lupe. Um, <laughs> any discussion? All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, aye. same. Thank you. Great. Yes, ma'am. Perfect, Philly. I'm paying attention. 100% <laughs> here. So today I wanted to talk about a new plan that we developed um, at our school for extended learning. And we've just implemented it. This is the sixth week that we've been doing it um, through the instructional leadership team. And just kind of wanted to go over um, what this plan is about and how it's working. So we were looking at the problem, and the problem was we, we we are a really data-driven school. We realized the importance of looking at data. And we looked at the fall gains data um, from the different um, Explore, Plan, ACT tests. And our instructional leadership team saw that the students were achieving low scores in many of the basic skills area across many different subjects. And when you're, you're looking and talking about we, we get different kids coming from all different backgrounds, whether or not they've been read to when they were young or, or their social economic status. And we take kids from where they're, where they're at and um, bring them up to where we need them to be. So one of the problems that we saw were a lot of the, the teachers see students coming in missing some of these basic skills. But all you can hear is teachers saying, well, we don't have the time to teach some of these, go backwards and teach some of these basic skills. We have, you know, Common Core, we have the standards. And so that was a big problem. We're trying to teach them Algebra 1, and they're not coming with some of the basic numeracy skills, or they're not coming with some of the grammar skills. And that's, that's been a problem that we've been dealing with, you know, for years. So looking at this fall gains data, we want the students to become college and career ready, as well as have some of these skills for them to be successful in high school. And I like this quote right here that's from the need. It says, in order to improve student achievement, we must have a sense of urgency for intentional planning and instructional delivery that not only deepens students' knowledge and skills of the prescribed curriculum, but also targets specific areas of deficiency as identified through this data. Um, so that's looking at also how can we go back and teach some of these skills in the prescribed curriculum. So we came up with a plan. And part of our action plan that we have been doing for the past couple years is we want the teachers to be on board and the teachers to feel ownership of any of the plans. So it's not the top down. So we started our action plan with the teachers um, at Professional Development. So we looked at the GAINS data. We showed the teachers by department. They came up with their conclusion for what we saw the students missing, which, which most of the time the, the teachers also realized that from the classroom. And after looking and analyzing some of that data, oops, and this is just a sample of the GAINS data um, for the science department. So we were looking at what they were doing in their test, looking at what kind of skills they were missing, um, some of the most missed type questions. Just in the science department itself, we saw there was a big problem with interpretation of data and graphical representation. <coughs> so the second part of our action plan was we actually had the staff take their content area portion of the ACT. This was really, really eye-opening for the staff. We have never done that before. So by having the staff take that and the staff realize what kind of skills should the students be having in order to take these kind of tests and the, to be college and career ready, rather than us always telling them students need to do this. The conversation after this was amazing. After taking it, just, just myself looking at the science portion, there wasn't a lot of 
background content knowledge that you needed to know, like memorization of facts, but what you really needed was those skills. How can you take the data? How can you apply that critical thinking, um, looking at two pieces of data and making inferences? So that sparked some great conversation and made teachers realize really what their students needed to know. And we also had the staff take a part of the Smarter Balance Assessment, which was also very eye-opening to see where we need students to be um, looking at that. So the Action Plan Part 2, after we had the staff buy-in, the staff were excited, what do we need to do, what can we do to gain some of these skills? Well, some of the skills we want to incorporate into our regular lessons, but the other part we were still looking at is they're still lacking some of these basic um, skills that they need to bring with them. So we decided we were going to, to start school 15 minutes earlier, and this started um, around second semester. So mind you, our school is already starting at 7.30, so <laughs> very early now, 7.15. And I know that's against all research to have school starting later, but we have to go with the school public buses, um, the public bus system for Grand Rapids. Mm -hmm. So we all agreed we're going to do 15 minutes earlier, and those 15 extra minutes were going to be added to the end of the third hour classes, and they're going to be called extended learning time. Each day at the end of third hour class was a different core focus. So if you look right here, here's a schedule. Um, looking at just in the science, we've got Monday writing, Tuesday is going to be um, looking at the core of math, reading, ELA, and science. Now the reason that we stagger them through the different departments like that is because some of the lucky teachers that have prep time during that felt left out. So if you were during the prep time, you actually would go and you would support other teachers that were doing the 15-minute um, extended time um, in your area of expertise. So they, they will support and come in um, because we have some of the English teachers who were scared saying, I can't do the math section or teach the math section. They have a support system. So our focus areas in science we wanted was the data representation, math, numeracy, ELA, grammar, social studies, a lot of the reading, and then we're doing writing across the content. And our goal for this was to improve the critical areas of deficiency that we saw in the GAINS data and to build more career and college ready skills for our students. This is just a sample of the science extended learning test. A lot of them mimic standardized, standardized tests where they'll have some graphical representation, some questions. Um, going through the process, let me go right here, the procedure, um, the students will get the test. This is during that last 15 minutes of their third hour. They put away all of the content. Um, that the student or that the teacher would be teaching during that hour. The test is given. We are timing the test. We find a lot of students are having a hard time pacing themselves when they're taking these tests. They're really thinking. And as we know, a lot of the standardized tests, the pacing is getting the kids. So we wanted to incorporate that as well. So we give the kids six minutes to take these um, few problems, ranging anywhere from um, three to six problems. And then they are going to use the Turning Technologies clicker system. And what this is is the kids can punch in their answer. They're going to be multiple choice. And the system will grade it for you and gives you all kinds of data analysis. So the students input their answers on the clicker. Then the teacher is going to look at the data they inputted. It can show right away. And they can show the students, well, it looks like in this class most of you or the majority of you miss questions two and five. So we're going to really go into depth on those <laughs> questions and the teacher will explain how um, they should have went about solving those questions. can also get some good group discussions as well. So again, here's just the data. We'll show which student, their clicker number, there's no student names attached with this. And the teacher will again take that data and they're going to print it and give it to um, our data support specialist um, for her to collect and analyze. So the next part is, of course, we have all this data. What are we going to do with it? So we're hoping to see an increase in, of scores over time <coughs> in each of the different content areas as, as we go through the year. Um, we're only in our sixth week, so we haven't seen much increase yet. We're also going to look at the problems that have the highest percentage wrong, the ones that the kids are struggling with most, um, the types of questions, and make more of those types of questions in future um, tests. Um, extended learning tests that we give them. 
And we're also going to see the needs of certain groups of students. Um, what are our ninth grade students really deficient in, or our 11th grade students, or the algebra or the math students, what kind of areas do they need more practice in? This is just a sample of what our data support specialists put together. Um, each of those are questions over there. The shaded one is from week one in science, and they're from each teacher. So it'll show what percentage of students received a correct answer in each of those five questions. And then in the lighter color there, they have five questions on the second week of science, and you can see what each student scored on those questions. Um, with a summary at the bottom. So again, we can focus on what the students are not understanding, the type of questions and the skills that they need to do those type of questions. So our next steps. As we are looking forward to next year, we are thinking about doing rotations instead, where we would do two weeks. We would spend um, two weeks just doing science, or two weeks just doing um, math or ELA and doing more mini modules that we are going to put together as a team this summer. Um, so the teachers don't have any more planning, any more prep time, but they're just going to be put together week by week to give the teachers. And then to work with the different needs of the different grade levels. Right now, all grade levels are getting the same um, test during their extended learning, but we know there's different needs for the ninth graders as opposed to the 10th or 11th graders. And then our goal through all this is hoping to see an increased scores in their explore plan, ACT testing, and also more importantly is to see those increase in the common um, core areas of career and college ready skills. So we think this is a good plan. We're on our sixth week of it and hoping to meet some of these needs where we say we don't have time to go back to remedi um, re remedial type of um, teaching that we're doing and be able just 15 minutes a day to have this and students to feel more confident in their skills as well. That's great, thank you. It's great to see Very innovations that... Yeah. But you know, it, uh, it, it brings up something, we talk about remediation and when they get to, co when they get to college, does this work? I don't know. Uh, thank you. Uh, we talk about the need for remediation in college. You don't talk about the need for remediation in high school. So there's something wrong with these elementary schools. That they're not doing, if they did everything that we have in the standards, you wouldn't have that problem. So how do we get them to implement our, our well, the core curriculum, now the common core it will be, uh, that you don't have to do remediation at the next level. And that's what's exciting. We really have to, we pay so much attention to the high school, we really have to pay attention to the uh, elementary school, and with more early childhood, we'll do better, I think, I mean, according to all the studies. So, but somehow or other, we had to focus on that, I think. And you through, um, and through looking at hopefully some of the Common Core, more of these standards will, will get there, but at the beginning of the year, my ninth grade students are coming in with a fourth grade reading level and a fourth grade math level. And that's the reality with the school. And we're expected to get them here mm -hmm. and they start here. And we have a big leap, you know, bringing my students yeah, from right. fourth grade to ninth grade in one year. And that's some of the reality that we have. And we're hoping some of these, you know, just doing some of this extended time will just help, you know, bring them up for those levels. But um, well, one of the things we don't talk about very much is that many of these schools, uh, the children, we're talking about poverty areas, and uh, we just don't talk about that enough, I don't think, because they need a lot of help. The early childhood is certainly in, in critical, I think, but we, we really have to recognize and admit that we have a problem there, and we should be doing focusing more on how do we bring the, those poorer children up when they start because they're behind when they start and it's, we expect them to do as well as people and you know much many more advantages and it, we really have to pour I think we have to pour resources people and financial into those areas over and above and we know I know we've done some of it but we haven't obviously done enough some something's lacking and we really have to figure out how to do that and I think it takes more resources 
I love the three R's of results require resources. And the resources include not only financial, but, but personnel, people resources. Just you know, want to comment on that, because I think we have to pay attention to it more than we admit. With that in mind, maybe two thoughts. One is I think it's why the board and we as a team were wise to even the first year of the MMC, the Michigan America Curriculum, mm -hmm. acknowledge that the, the then new uh, grade level content expectations to give clarity to second grade teachers so there was alignment. I know and we're doing all these things supposed to work. I hope all these things they're come working. together and work. They're working. You, you look at, they're, they're working. Yeah. And I mean, districts are really stepping up on this. And I think this is one reason, just as an aside, I wasn't going to, local soups are probably worth more than I'm being paid. So, because they, their job is to make sure this is aligned, you know, and that you don't have the situation that Bobby Joe mm -hmm. just, to make sure this alignment is in place. And I really do, I, I see enough evidence of this every month. I think a lot mm -hmm. of that is happening. But I would put in a, a, a pitch for our team Kyle being here that led, they call it, they basically have called it a superintendent's challenge, but the, the renewal of the breakfast challenge, this is an example where there are resources and people don't use them. I, I mean, to me, I st we're trying to be kind about this, but if we have 50% of the eligible poor kids to get breakfast and don't get breakfast, we're trying to do this through incentives, but it's kind of like, when do you finally throw your hands up and say, everyone's says we need resources, here's resources, because you can't learn if you have, don't have a breakfast, and many of these kids are the very kids that aren't, aren't served uh, a breakfast, and people need our encouragement to step up. So, I mean, I, the, the, the frustration sometimes with resources is even when it's there, people aren't taking advantage of it. Your question, of course, is much broader, and I would agree 100%. I mean, there, we, have to, we have to understand and acknowledge that there are kids with needs that are catch-up needs, not ketchup, mustard, ketchup, but <laughs> catching up needs that right. that require resources. And that's why I think I, I well, felt really lucky for us that we got... The start gets funded the way, you know, and even that's not enough, but it's better than we've done. Exactly. And I, and I think also I feel good and feel lucky that we got great start as opposed to DHS. I think is a greater alignment. There's mm -hmm. more likelihood we can get this done, and it was a big, uh, a big breakthrough for that. Yes, sir. Yeah. Well, we sometimes have, we sometimes assume that uh, the presence of poverty and poor uh, scholastic performance has somehow some kind of cause effect when in fact they're probably both symptoms of another cause that we as an institution, as a, as a school institution, maybe are not able to address directly. And um, uh, we could launch in all kinds of uh, theoretical uh, discussion, but I'll, I won't. Listen, I have to do one order of duty here because this is the meeting where the superintendent's contract comes up. You know, not that I'm sensitive about that. And so it, it calls, this is just normal for folks in the audience, that according to Section 8 of the Open Meetings Act, uh, that we do this each year, that a public officer can request a closed session. Uh, I'm doing this as I've done every year. Therefore, I will entertain a motion followed by a roll call vote. John, supported by Richard. Uh, I think you need to do a roll call on that. Austin? Yes. Specto? Yes. Ramos Montini? Yes. Strauss? Yes. Albrecht Absence? Varner? Yes. Weiser? Yes. Ziley? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. Thank you. And audience, it's probably, it could very well be a little longer than the typical hour we take, uh, so keep that in mind. And um, Dan, we probably need 10 minutes, and you probably need that also to, to get situated with uh, lunch. And I think uh, Marilyn has worked out a way to call into that for both you and Cassandra. Great. Great. You just dial in using the same numbers, and I'll have you connect. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And I think you can pick up, because Uncle Roman, I think you can pick up lunch on the way. I don't mean you have to go out and pick it up, it's right. Go to McDonald's and pick up some lunch.